I'm going to do the cocktail this time. Scott okay. is. Scott's, but we're recording. I know. Scott is out um, doing tripod legs, so he, we can't bother him. We need to get these tripods done. They finally, the, the uh, right. stuff was delayed, so. Hey, everybody. Hi. Episode nine. Episode live nine. Live from Burbank, California. Yeah. Boy, oh, boy, we oh, boy. A, we have a great uh, show for everybody today. We do, but first, let me say, Tanya Canelli. Hello, Hi. how are you today? Good. Looking fabulous in your fall colors. Well, thank you very much. I'm getting that. into the spirit of tea time. Hi, Brian Valente. That's me. How are you today? I'm great. Good to see you. Hey. Yeah. You are another year around the sun. Yeah, it's That's true. since the my... last time I saw you. I know. October Happy 4th birthday. was my, my birthday. Yeah. Yes, so thank you. Happy. And you got you got a birthday coming up, right? I do. I'm November 5th and Scott's November 14th. I can't yeah, so that. we all are right in the same time. It is. Are you? A, I'm a Libra. What are you? Scorpio and Scott's Scorpio. We both are. You know what's coming up? There's a birthday next year. Who? Whose birthday next? Oh, I know. It's uh, the, the G11. G11. Yes. Thirty years that the G11 has been. Thirty years introduced into the world. Yes. Gosh, that's amazing. And in fact, in our last uh, our last newsletter just dropped yesterday. I think. Yes. We had a customer, uh, Philip or Philippe, I think it's Philip, okay. uh, who has a 1992 G11 still going strong. He just did the upgrades yes. for a Gemini 2. He put it's it astonishing. as a go-to, yeah, and the RA extension, he says it's working like a workhorse after putting a little love into it with right. some elbow grease, right. right? Now, I don't want to get too far without pointing out that we have what the a fun remote guest. Our very, very, Our very first, first one. one we're probably going to F it up a couple of times, I'm sure. <laughs> but I want folks to say hello to Edward Plummer. Hi, Edward. Edward. Hi. Hey, Brian. Hi, Tanya. How are you all doing? Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. You have been uh, a long time, relatively speaking, a long time Lost Mandy customer, right? You have a, what, what, what a gear do you have over there? Well, right now I've, I've got a, a G11 that um, I actually got at the beginning of the year. I've been consolidating a lot of the equipment I have. Um, nice. I started with a GM8 um, that I had gotten used in order to take on a on a field trip, and uh, that I could pack on the airline and split it apart. So I'll show you some slides of that. Fabulous. Um, so, um, and uh, I've gone through the upgrades of Gemini from Gemini one up through the Mini that we have uh, on now. So that <laughs> that's a nice improvement that's great i'm, I'm just edward... cutting to he can't see this but she's struggling with trying to get this bottle open and i'm just um... <laughs> i'll have to see it in live oh you'll, you'll see you'll it you'll see it, in, you'll see it in the edit right but um but edward you so so the reason we have you on um and it's not a spoiler alert but you've been you've been fairly active in the forums i know you've been you know working with nina the nighttime imaging mm -hmm. and astronomy software uh, and you posted some really intriguing uh, spreadsheets and explanations of, of doing Meridian Flip. And we're going to, you've agreed graciously, and we're so grateful, uh, but you've agreed to come on the show and kind of give a more expanded version of talking through this. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I've seen the presentation you prepared. It's an ex excellent it's, presentation. It really is. Yes. Uh, of not just Meridian Flips, but just kind of generally how limits work and how they relate to, to flips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are looking forward to that. Very, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned on this podcast. It's a good one. Yeah. So we're going to just uh, cut away from you, Edward, for a moment because we got our sort of normal, uh, or I guess our regular uh, segments. Segments. Yes. Our and I need to uh, start this one. Here we go. Our tea time with Tanya. And they call it tea time with Tanya. The finest girl you'll ever know. <laughs> I'm doing the cocktail this time. So, like I said, Scott's out doing the tripod legs. We finally just got him in today, so he's out machining those. Uh, Scott's so machining the tripod legs. Yeah. Yes, yeah, because um, he does that. That's his machining d deal. So, but I wanted to make a tea time with Tanya today. Is all about um, summer, autumn's in. No, Summer's it's not about out. summer. It's about fall. It's about fall. That's yes. right. Thank you for correcting me. So uh, move over margarita. Pumpkin spice is here. Okay. So I made a pumpkin spice cocktail. 
So our, we have a we have an alcohol but, recipe, a drink recipe that is what is it again? Okay, so um, I wanted to give a, a shout out to George Shoop. He is a customer of ours. I just he's awesome. He's great. He's um, loves his mouth. We love George. He always sends and me emails he, with, with links and things. Thanks, George. Yeah, um, he sent us this bottle of gin, and um, so thank you, George. We really thank appreciate you. that. That's so really, I that's wanted great. to make a cocktail, a pumpkin spice cocktail. So it's, uh, I did one shot of gin, one shot of Irish cream, and a little bit of pumpkin caramel syrup. Okay, what is, can we see this again? What is this pumpkin? Oh. So it's not pumpkin spice, it's pumpkin caramel? Yeah, I, yeah. Pumpkin caramel, and it does say skinny, so it's okay for me to drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And some Irish cream, okay? Okay. And then the gin. All so right. So it's one part of each. Is that the deal? It's, it's one, one, and then like a little bit less than a half of the pumpkin. Okay. Yeah. So okay. a little, a little splash of, of flavor or something. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So this is my first time trying it. Oh, wait. And then I coated the martini glasses with nutmeg and cinnamon. All right. So let's try this. Oh, oh, oh. Gosh. All right. Let's see. Do you want to try it just to try it? I want you, I want you to try okay. it first. I'll, I'm right. scared. <laughs> <laughs> like you just dump, you just like dump half of it literally all over the table in your in I your know. new iPhone I guess I, 13. I'm not, and... I, I, oh, I know. I did get the new iPhone 13, not because I wanted to. All right, let's try this. Cheers, pumpkin spice. She dropped her other phone in a pool. I'm not kidding. This is so good. Yes, my pool floated to the bottom of a pool, and because it had cracks <laughs> in it, it was no longer waterproof, which the um, they are waterproof. You got to try this. This is really good. Just try a little sip. I know you don't like to really drink, but it's really good. I, I made a little bit for Scott, too. I want Scott to come by and try it once he's done with being out back. What do you think? <coughs> that gin is strong, right? Jesus. <laughs> 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 good job on the gin, George. Holy God. That really is. A, that's a good one. <clears throat> that's a good one here. It, that, did you not like it or do you like it? Yeah, I'm, having time, I'm having a hard time talking. Right? Yeah, George. So um, beware because I do think that the, there is a great story behind this. The Plymouth Gin Navy Strength. Okay. <laughs> That is what you've got. You, Navy it would be, strength it would right be nice if you actually let me know about Navy strength ahead of time. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever tried this, but now I'm feeling warm. I'm getting really hot. <laughs> when I was a young kid, I, uh, you know, we all try cigarettes at some point, I think. Right. And, uh, the only cigarettes I could find were Navy cut cigarettes, which is basically a non-filtered cigarette. Oh. And I, it, it, I'm recalling that experience of being sick to my stomach and having something it probably made that you never smoke again wait no that's not true oh. although i did quit a long long time ago that's quit good many decades ago but uh that's good yeah, it was and then another couple other things um okay, okay so what i'm sorry so what is this drink called now a uh, pumpkin spice latte well, it's not a lot. It's uh, pumpkin spice pumpkin latte cocktail. Cocktail. Yeah, I think it's something like that. It, I saw the recipe. It's a UK recipe. So yeah. So right. or at least it was on a UK website. I'm not going to say it was a UK recipe. So I did. Trader Joe's has these pumpkin spice batons. Let me tell you, these are a great little treat. Hold them back a little bit so we oh, can see. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Just want to make sure they're. So what is this called? Pumpkin, pumpkin spice, spice batons. batons. Okay, they're very very light wafers with a little bit of pumpkin like cream in the middle, but not heavy. It's not like heavily coated. It's just kind of lightly coated. So it's a dessert kind of thing. Oh yeah. Even okay. Scott was not. Scott did not think he would like these. He loves them. He. So I'm going to be getting a few of these cans for around the office. Okay. All right. And then um, I'm spicing up our studio here with a pumpkin spice vanilla candle. What's I'm telling v you, you get pumpkin spice for? everything. Is that the, is that the, is that the VP? Is that the, oh, it's a Trader Joe's candle. Yeah. Yeah. But you can literally get, I love candles. I love candles. I, um, I give them as gifts all the time because you can't go wrong, you know, and candles can be expensive. You know, this one wasn't too bad. I think this was only like four or five dollars, but they can they can go up to be a lot more than that. <laughs> oh my god, Brian! So, pumpkin spice again. It does smell like pumpkin spice. I, now that my my sense of smell is returning from that drink. <laughs> okay, and then another sort thing. Of. Pumpkin, 
Pumpkin, pumpkin. This I also, I obviously shop at Trader Joe's, okay? What, so it's it's maple flavor with other, maple and sea salt kettle corn. Yes, yeah, so I did pour some here, so I'm, I'm going to try some maybe, but um, I haven't tried it yet, but I know the guys here love it, the well, machinist. Are you going to try it? Just um, give, it a, give it a little. Give it a little whirl. Okay. All right, let's do this. All right, that's good. It's a giant. If they're giant kernels. I Light, mean, yes, huge. lightly. Hi, Scott. Hey, I yes, I made you a drink. You got to try this. It's I so good. <laughs> That's the candle. <laughs> Has Scott not tried this before? No, none of us have. This is the first time. This is fun. Don't bang on anything, how Scott. Are, how's how's uh, machining? Oh, just super duper. How's the machining going? Do you want to come right here? I told everybody, so everybody's loving you. A cameo by Scott. There we go. Okay. All right, let's try this. This gin is strong. I think you told me it's strong. It's super strong. Yeah, it is. It's the strongest gin in the <laughs> And then I'll go and do machining afterwards. And show Take just a right little, down. little sip, please. <laughs> it's good, right? Who's going to get that tripod? <laughs> See, he was coffee. <laughs> this is Edward Plummer. Have you met him? I don't think so. There's Edward. Hi, Here's Scott. Edward. Pleasure to meet you. You too? I don't know if I'm on in here. You're on whatever. his camera. He's okay. there. Yeah, he can so, sit back um, and sort of see you. But yes, uh, he is doing a presentation today with Nina, which is a processing software. Am I correct? Or guiding software? It's Im Well, it's image acquisition software. Yeah. Image acquisition right. software with right. the Meridian Flip and um, doing that. So with the I Gemini. like how you're telling Scott what we're actually doing on the podcast as we're actually about to do it. Like, oh, hey, by the way, this podcast. Oh, you're doing that today? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I'll finish, since I don't have to thank you thank you very very much since uh, I'm not machining I'll be finishing all okay, these you can do that. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to drive okay back to work you right, go on, go on. <laughs> thanks Scott bye. bye all right so that's tea time with Tanya all okay, right pumpkin yeah, yeah. spice so so Get the theme the so this is uh, uh, winter sorry summer into fall you got this snappy uh, outfit that you're wearing as well. It's very yes. fall colored. Thank very, you. Yes, and, I love this. Uh, recap for us. So we've got the pumpkin spice latte, latte cocktail. cocktail. Gin from George Shoup. Gin, okay, which is Navy so you want to do strength. Yeah. It's, uh, one part and then one part uh, Irish liquor, liqueur, okay. Irish Baileys. Oh. Uh, and then 20% of. Um, Pumpkin syrup, okay? It can be, yeah, it's pumpkin caramel, but they could use pumpkin spice too, right? Right, yeah, right. that's just the one I found. Okay. Um, I found it at Bed Bath & Beyond because, trust me, you might have trouble finding it. <laughs> I, or you could probably just order popular. it on Amazon, right? Sadly. Yeah, and then um, and then I just nut, I put the uh, the trimmings around the glass with the uh, nutmeg, nutmeg and, and cinnamon. cinnamon. Yeah, it's okay. great. Yeah, so... And then the second thing is these things. Yeah, pumpkin spice uh, batons. Pumpkin spice batons. Yeah. And then the third thing was the this. The kettle corn, or the candle. The candle. And uh, the from, kettle corn. From Trader, the candle's from Trader Joe's. Yep. It's lit and we're in, it's infusing enjoying it. the studio. <laughs> is that what you want to call it, enjoying it? Do you want me to blow it out? No, it's fine. Okay. Because then I don't smell like smoke and stuff. Okay. Oh, yeah. But, uh, and then the third thing is maple and sea salt kettle corn. Right? Yes. And so far, all of it was a success. So yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very monochromatic presentation mm -hmm. so far. So oh. That's lovely. So, hope you all like that. Yeah, so. it's wonderful. Thank you for listening to Tea Time. Yay, Tea with Time! Tanya. <laughs> now it's uh, Observatory Talk with Brian. Let's get to the, let's get to what everybody really wants to hear. Yeah, and, and uh, astronomy uh, stuff. Astronomy type stuff. So, so normally I talk about. Uh, the uh, remote observatory I have in, uh, in the Atacama Desert with OBSTEC. Uh, today I'm going to talk just brief, it's a very brief conversation, but um, there's been a lot of discussion about using periodic error correction, uh, which the Gemini supports fully. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, kind of how do we go about it in, in using this uh, third party software named PEMPRO. Okay, it's yes. from uh, a guy named Ray Greylack, mm -hmm. a very talented guy, and uh, it's sold through CCD Ware. Uh, okay. It is a, it is a third party product that costs money, right? right. So, okay, uh, but it does have a sixty day trial, and I wanted to sort of just kind of walk through the process, document it, and we do have a uh, kind of a guide on how to use uh, PEMPRO to reduce periodic error in your Lost Mandy Mountain. We're gonna put the um, we're gonna put the or the link to this guide in Excellent. the description. Is that below. gonna be on the technical support page? 
of our website or? Yeah, I, I, eventually we're going to do that, right? Okay. Because um, the idea is uh, we want to kind of run it through the user form, have people use it, see if there's any questions, kind of flesh it out. Okay. And then we're going to uh, make it available on the technical support do side Do the of final things. draft on the, yeah. I mean, chances are it's probably going to come become a... Um, it's going to turn into a video tutorial at some point. But, Excellent. Uh, yeah, right now it's a written document. So the link is uh, below. We'll All check right. it out. Everybody and, loves the tutorials that we're doing. Yeah. So this is just an image uh, of uh, NGC 7331 okay. and uh, the Deerlick group and also um, the quintet there in the corner. Um, this is just a, an example image. I don't want to, you know, claim any magic to this. Uh, now, but, where is this at? Is this here in L.A.? Uh, this or is, is done, this... I was, uh, so I I moved uh, uh, the imaging up north. Okay. Uh, so there's slightly better skies. Right. And uh, what I was really testing here was I was trying to test the, um, I did a periodic error correction and I was testing the tracking and everything. So this is about 17 hours of data. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's basically RGB and it's synthetic luminance. Uh, so nothing magical about this, but I was getting about uh, 0.4 uh, arc second. Uh, yeah, point, point 0.4 arc seconds per um, kind of overall RMS, nice. which is actually really On the G11, good. that is incredible. Yeah, Very so incredible. that was guided, of course. But, um, you know, I really think that the uh, periodic error correction made a, made a big, big difference. Nice. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of demonstrate that. Again, okay. this is not a, a tremendously high-resolution uh, version of this, but... Uh, uh, you know, I think it came out. It came out I nicely. Love, I and love all the stars it. Yes. around, and you know, got some nice uh, color, and the skies are a little bit uh, darker there. So it's very I was nice. happy with uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, ch ch so the observatory talk, the very short version of observatory <laughs> talk, is check check out the uh, guide uh, in the description below. Um, it is specific to the Lost Mandy Mount, but I mean, kind of generally just describes how periodic error correction works with PEMPRO. Okay, uh, we'll put a link. Uh, to PEMPRO in there as well. Uh, so you can download it and use it for a 60 day trial and, you know, give it a whirl. I think this is going to make some people happy that keep putting it on our comments of the podcast. Like, when are you going to do some PEMPRO? When are you going to do some? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Okay, everybody, no, we, need to, we need to show Brian some love here, okay? Some love. You don't even need to show me love, but but yes, it's, it's a topic that I've been wanting to do for yes. a while. Yes, And uh, so we don't quite have the video uh, available mm -hmm. yet, but we do have a guide at least, and I think it's pretty pretty thorough. So Well, we just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say just, uh, just yeah, any feedback you guys have, either in the comments or in the user forms or whatever, just let us know because we want to improve it. Right, right. Um, as you know, Brian does do a lot of our instructional videos, all, mostly all of them. I'm never in a... And the, we just did our newsletter, and you just did an instructional video on the iPolar oh, yeah. with so the let's, Gemini. Let's uh, let's talk uh, about that, that. Is that right here? This uh, is it. So this is the iPolar. So right. this is the a, a uh, this is a device uh, that allows you to do kind of uh, computer assisted polar alignment. Um, it's similar. So so it's a it's a camera. Okay. Uh, it's a it's got a lens, mm -hmm. and you plug it into your Windows computer, and you run their little software. And uh, it's kind of like uh, move the circle over the the um, cross, and it gives you uh, accurate pol you know, sub arc minute uh, accurate polar alignment. Nice. So we liked this so much, right? That right. We, we are now carrying this. We are, yes. So you can purchase this with um, through our website with your specific adapter. So right. um, if you need a G eleven. Those aren't out yet because you set we set that up to they're, they're making they're them. making them right uh -huh. yeah um, you can pre order them now um, the eight eleven this yeah. is the eight eleven one so the eight eleven it needs to clear the motor because the motor's so close to that that deck access hole where you're gonna plug this into right. so um, well, it's the GM eight or the GM eight eleven it's anything correct. with the G eight uh, deck access yes right? it yeah. will work with the eleven it's just kind of and, yeah, it's just know. tall. Yeah. But, it, you know, the idea is to screw it in. But anyway, yeah. so we did a tutorial on this. I'll put the link uh, below. Uh, it will work just fine. It's a great tutorial. Um, and it's a it's a great little device. It's fairly inexpensive. It's similar, if you've heard of Pole Master, it's similar mm -hmm. to that. If okay. you have Pole Master, I'd say hang on to it. There's no, they're, they're just kind of. Um, similar. They're very, very similar. And uh, it's kind of six a, a, one and half dozen the other. I think probably the results are very similar. Okay. What I like about this one, though, is it does it, does it through plate solving. So it hides a lot of the complexity 
Uh, it is sort of this notion of kind of, you know, put the dot over the, the cross kind of thing. Okay. But uh, it hides it hides kind of how complex that is because it's continuously plate solving to try to, you know, give you the best results possible. Got it. All yeah. right. Very nice. Thank you. It's a great video. We've already got some orders. So I, I <laughs> the newsletter we, I think worked. We sold out of our <laughs> initial did. run that we anticipated. We had to order more, more already. So. We did. So I'm glad people like it, though. It obviously is, I mean, if they're ordering it, it must work. They got a lot out of your tutorial, so. Yeah, and I do want to mention, by the way, and this is true of all the tutorials, sometimes someone will point out something about the tutorial that either I missed or didn't explain well, so I always try to go back in the description and do a little update, whether it's uh, pointing to another video or explaining something a little bit better. So anytime you do watch any of the video tutorials we have, always read the description because we're trying to keep it updated and making sure that it's accurate. Things That's like great. That. That's great. Great. Thanks for telling us that. Mm -hmm. I did not know. All right. So I think that is all that I kind of wanted to talk about and say hi to everybody. And anything else, I mean, besides getting on to Edward. Oh, let's talk. So let's talk briefly about oh. some things we got coming up. Okay. So, and this is more just uh, kind of an FYI for everybody. We've, we, we got ourselves a ASI Air Pro. Mm -hmm. Boy, oh boy. Edward, Edward, have you tried this thing at all? <laughs> gotta unmute myself. Um, I've I've played with the Ecos uh, environment on a Raspberry Pi, um, but not the ASI Air Pro uh, kind of prepackaged system. Yeah, so this is from from ZWO, and it is a uh, it's based on the Ecos sort of um, idea. Yeah, environment. I guess okay. for lack of a better term, but they've packaged it up to try to make it very very simple. It works only with ZWO cameras and accessories, but it's very popular. It's very small and very simple to operate. It has uh, uh, it's got USB ports in it. It's got power ports on it. Nice. You know, one of the things I like about uh, this approach is, uh, for example, they have the electronic focusing unit and it runs off five volts, which is a freaking miracle. Not, using, so, not draining a lot of power. Yeah, so you can actually just plug it directly into a USB port and it's going to do both data and power, which is, got is it. really nice. So nice. Got, yeah, so... Um, it's, it is popular with a lot of people using it with the Lost Mandy setup and so um, and their ZWO cameras. So we might do a tutorial and we just want to be able to support these a little bit better with the Gemini. Yeah, I think that's, that's our, true. That's our idea. And here's a second. So this is sort of the, the big boy version. This is the, uh, so this the is the end. same idea. This is from Software Bisque. It's called the Sky Fusion. And it's essentially the same idea. It's an all-in-one type of unit. It's, um, it's very, quite heavy. It's machined aluminum box. It has a DV, DNV style clamp, uh, clamp which is really nice. Uh, that is nice. Um, it's got the same concept, right? So it's, it's, it's computer built in here. It's got, looks like maybe Wi Fi. Oh, yes. Type stuff. Yeah, God, you notice everything. Uh, and it has um, Anderson power poles. Whoops. Kind of turn it upside down. Anderson power poles for uh, power out. Okay. Which, uh, you, I mean, you have to build your own cables. But right, that's right. Not a big deal. I don't know what this serial. This like they actually might board. sell cables. I think that oh, they, do they do. I, I'm almost positive. You know what? Cables did come in the box. I, I we just kind of pulled out what was <laughs> in there. But the, there are there's Were you great tell instructions. Me that? <laughs> there's great instructions. It comes with tools in the box, and it does have some cables. But you may need to buy if you need to buy extra cables. I think when I was looking on their website, I did see right. cables that you could purchase. So, so this is brilliantly well made. Yes, um, and and, and uh, so basically, there's a computer in here. I'm not sure what operating system it runs, but I'm going to find out here. But um, basically, this is kind of a um, a utility that's based on the Sky the Sky X Pro, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So it includes that software, and if you know if you like that software and want to run it and want to kind of have an all in one type of system, this seems to be the unit uh, that's going to be maybe the future of yeah. How it's they they've work. been they've been doing very well. They said it's high demand. So. Um, yeah, it's pretty, I mean, it's serious. It's, yeah. it's really well machined. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful yeah. piece of equipment. So we're going to try this out. Thank you, Steve Biss, for sending that to us. So oh. we can, we just want, you know, like we said, we want to be able to support people that are using a Lost Mandy with these products. So right, thank right. you, Steve, for sending that over. And thanks, Dorothy, for getting out the door for us. We appreciate it. I want to check them out, too. I know you do. You love toys. toys. <laughs> Astronomy toys. toys. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, um, excuse me. <clears throat> let's get to the uh, main event here. So. Edward, I know you've been super cool and hanging out there listening to our inane rantings about uh, pumpkin spice, what have you. 
fact, getting scared about getting scared about that mount that Scott's over there building now, though. I know. You have yeah, to. You may have to put. You may have to put that one aside. <laughs> right. That's a good one. That's true. He's probably he's probably just asleep in the corner now or something. Who knows? So, um, but uh, so let's so let's kind of. Uh, I want to set the stage because you're going to talk a bit about, uh, I'm sorry, what I should say is we've asked you, we're really, we've got a chance to know you a little bit. We're super fascinated uh, by your kind of story of how you got into all this. And you're going to share with us some of the, um, you know, things you've learned about Nina and in particular uh, the Meridian Flip I know, but um, could you just spend a little bit of time kind of introducing yourself uh, to the audience and talking a little bit about your background and kind of how you came to be in all this? Yeah, sure. Um, and I can share a few uh, few slides as well because, you know, as a academic kind of guy, I love PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a retired software engineer. Um, I basically have been in the industry of uh, industrial uh, control automation and um, retired this year. Uh, and uh, I actually got my start in, in visual observing. So um, I started out with this mount basically and uh, worked with a uh, Dobsonian for, uh, for a few years, um, just getting to learn the sky and uh, learning all the coordinate systems. And what's really nice about what you see here there are no computers. Yeah. Um, a lot of people yeah, start with Dobs Dobsonians. Yeah. It's like, yeah. seems to be, yeah. I, every time I have somebody who's interested in, in astronomy, I usually point them this direction. It's a great way to get started. Nice. Get a great, great, even, even if the skies aren't great, you get a good view. Uh, you aren't encumbered by learning all the mounts and the technology and Windows drivers right, and right. whatever else has to get yeah, in your way. And you get to really enjoy the sky. And then you get somebody like in my case it was my wife who started looking at astrophotography i love that uh, that's somewhat and, unusual usually it's the wife that's trying to, to yeah this was kind of kind of the other way around she also has a long-term uh interest in astronomy science uh and whatnot and so she actually got a small mountain camera and started doing astrophotography and i kind of looked over her shoulder and said yeah i gotta have me some of that <laughs> I love so it. Yeah, it was a very nice way to combine working with technology, engineering, building things, and also being able to uh, express creative artistic uh, image processing. It's kind of that unique combination that you get from astrophotography. Yeah, definitely. But it is it is a it can be a bit of a frustrating journey through all kinds of different equipment. <laughs> I got a that. smorgasbord of that on the screen here. All the different cameras and mounts and telescopes that I kind of went through. And a lot of that is, you know, is trying to figure out what focal length you're really interested in imaging and, and settling on something eventually that, uh, that, that, that fits your imaging style. Mm -hmm. um, cameras were a weird thing for me. I kind of went a really weird way. I, I, I knew I wanted a CCD camera, but I, I couldn't afford it. And so I did everything everything short of buying one initially my first camera was was that little webcam you see up in the top left corner um, a little Philips webcam yep. found some articles online on how to modify it so that it would do long exposure and and uh, cut down on the amp glow that it has and so I played with that a bit and then I decided I really need a cooled version so then some pictures there of me trying to hack together a Pelche cooled uh, system I basically call this my Franken cam. Um, <laughs> is that the black I, box that's uh, that we see there in the middle? Yeah, that black box is the next is Franken cam two. So we'll get there. <laughs> uh, Franken cam one was I kind of think it looked like the Apollo, uh, the original Apollo uh, spacecraft on its way to the moon there. Uh, PVC tubing with uh, aluminum that I kind of did in the garage. But I did manage to get that picture on the bottom of the Lagoon Nebula. You might Brian, that's you might lower, lower kind left, of recognize right. that on the lower left, that that's the Lagoon Nebula. Nice. That was the webcam, Astro Franken cam through a through a 50 millimeter finder scope that I that I was using. So that's actually one of my very first astro images. That's great. Um, so I found that in my archives. Um, I'm pleased to compare that to the one on the right, actually. The bit in the middle, I went through a period with DSLR cameras. I hacked uh, one of our Rebel cameras 
um, to take off the little film so that you could do H alpha imaging. It's got that little filter that blocks the lower, the lower. Right. Uh, right. So you converted bandwidth. that to full spectrum, right? Yeah. So I broke that out and uh, converted that to full spectrum. And then the, the picture in the middle is me once again trying to get a cooled camera. This time it was a big plywood box that the uh, DSLR sat in with a big gigantic computer cooling fan. And yeah, that kind of worked, but yeah, it's hard to control the amount of dew and precipitation in the camera. So that got retired to the garage pretty quickly. <laughs> um, a bit bit awkward looking on top of the GM8 there. Uh, eventually, I did save up for a, a real Astro cam. Uh, in my case, it was a, Q, um, a QSI camera. No, that's um, a great camera. And that's the same one I still use. I haven't uh, upgraded to any of the more uh, modern CMOS camera. So this is CCD camera, interlaced, uh, interline camera. But the image on the lower right is uh, Lagoon Nebula again, uh, with with a little bit better equipment. So it, nice. it, it certainly does make a difference. Yeah. Oh, it does. But right now, um, I this is pretty much the summary of what I'm mainly doing DSO work with. I built an observatory a few years after um, I got started um, so that I could keep things set up in the backyard. And I went through the normal putting up screens and plywood plywood sheets. And yeah, I got tired of that. So right, I finally sure. found this Explorer dome and uh, put together a little pier and building to put that in, in the backyard. It's a very nice observatory. Yeah, Very so, nice. so how, that, how big that, is this thing? It's not, I mean, that door looks huge, but if, if I stand next to it, the top of the door comes to about my waist. Oh, okay. so it's, oh, it, it's a wow. bit of a hobbit house. Yeah, it's a bit of a hobbit house. That is house. like an Alice in Wonderland house, right? Yeah, now. it's very yeah. much so, <laughs> ex except without the rabbit. Um, <laughs> But it's 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 a little challenging when you have people invited over uh, how to get into it without smashing one's head or or the back <laughs> of one's spine is is a little is a little clever. But once you're inside and standing inside the dome, nice. it, it it works fine. Nice. Um, so over on the on the right is is what I'm is what I'm normally imaging with G11 a uh, TMB 130 SS uh, refractor. So that's what I kind of finally settled on for the focal yeah, length uh, uh, system that I that I found to be the best compromise. This one's really nice because it's got a feather touch focuser on it, which is just butter smooth. I love right, that. Right, right. That's uh, top notch right there. Yeah, yeah that's. And you do, that, I've noticed on your lower left, uh, and this is something you posted to the user forums and it yeah. got quite a lot of response on this, but uh, you've done your own custom cases for this too, right? Yeah, my wife, after after me uh, spending two weeks on those, said you have to put the picture of the cases on there. So um, beautiful. That, that was that was her input. Yeah, so I, I, I put together some custom cases that I could haul everything around. So the whole lot, everything I need goes in four boxes. Now, mind you, they're not light boxes. The, uh, the two little ones are about 60 pounds and the two big ones are about 80 pounds. But that's the tripod fully assembled with all the 3D wow. printed gadget gadgets that I that I use to hang all the equipment on, the refractor in another box, and then the the, the separate headpieces. I really love that separable deck and RA axis on the G11. That, oh yeah, that is was... that it, that makes it so much easier to put the thing up. It um, does. Yeah, because you don't have it. That's the RA. It's lighter and it doesn't fold and pinch your fingers when right. you're trying to get it up there. So I really like that. Um, yeah, that and then 35 the pounds camera. is pretty heavy when you're holding that little mount, you know, when it was one. So Yeah, the big ones have that. wheels, so I can kind of wheel them around and kind of nice. lift them up into the trunk of the car. The other ones are a bit of a, a bit of a stretch to lift those up. But uh, yeah, those those came out nice. So that's that's what I normally I've got a few other things, a small 180, uh, sorry, 80 millimeter refractor and Orion ED carbon fiber. It's a really nice little inexpensive scope does a really good job mm -hmm. and then a solar scope i'll show you some images of those um but i've i've kind of consolidated down to the just the just the one mount at this point um quick gallery of some pictures mostly to show that i'm that i kind of like to do things more than dso i kind of like to also capture things that are kind of transient in nature right. um, so like the picture on the top um, left was a, a solar image that I was doing uh, from the observatory. Wow. And what was really cool was that's a X-class flare that you see in the middle. And I actually caught that and watched that happen just completely by accident. Wow. It's like, wow, what happened on this image? <laughs> and then yes. followed it as it decayed down as that, as yeah, that flare. And then went pretty, afterwards and looked online mm -hmm. and found that that was a pretty uh, spectacular X-class flare that had gone off. So I kind of enjoy finding serendipitous things. There was a 
a supernova in the Whirlpool galaxy that I had caught an image of, but it was only a week later when I read the article, then I went back and went, ah, oh, it was in there. Nice. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Kind of an after the, after the fact. That caused um, quite a took, bit of, uh, of, of uh, interest in the various user forums. People yeah, realized yeah. when caught that. Oh, I wow. kind of been really cool to have actually noticed it in the image before the postings online that would have been even more neat yeah. but uh after the fact was still pretty cool um we took a trip up to uh nebraska uh we're in we're normally in texas here i took a trip up to nebraska to see the uh, big eclipse event mm -hmm. chasing around trying to find somewhere yeah. there were no clouds and and had a little fun with that so beautiful that's a nice. few images do a lot of narrow band this imaging one. i love as this. well what that was him. Go ahead. What, Sorry, Tanya. Yeah, so I do a lot of narrow band imaging as well. The light light pollution's not not great here in the Austin area, um, but that's another great reason to have a CCD camera or a new CMOS camera, cooled camera. That you can do long enough exposures to really get the narrow band. Especially the sulfur takes a long time to get any kind of uh, any yeah, kind cool. of signal out. So a shot on the on the left that's uh, all three colors and one on the right that's just H alpha, just kind of the picture in the bottom is planetary stuff. Uh, don't have a great planetary setup yet. That's actually using a DSLR uh, 60DA camera and it's VGA crop mode that gives you a, not a great resolution, but it does give you a ability to do um, uh, the, the video. And this was kind of a neat shot because these were all taken on the same night, wow. same same focal length um moon the only thing missing is pluto and mercury that i, I mercury was <laughs> too too low down in the horizon um, with the trees right. to get but spent the night and got all of the all of those planets in one night so that was kind of fun i really like um, that beautiful yeah that was kind of fun uh, unfortunately mars kind of had a sandstorm that day so there's not a lot of detail that yeah. came out uh, the other thing we do with uh, both my wife and I have enjoyed, uh, we call it astro camping, uh, basically <laughs> lugging all the equipment out somewhere, uh, either to the local dark sky site for the club or, uh, or camping other in more remote state parks and setting up the equipment and uh, being able to enjoy the dark skies, uh, not being around anybody else and uh, taking, taking, taking images. Um, so an example of, uh, out doing that um that's a that's kind of a challenge brian i don't know how 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 you guys do that from chile because every time i go out to do remote imaging there's always something that goes wrong it's like the first night is always getting all the equipment working it's like there's nothing like being 10 hours from the local uh hardware store to convince your usb cables they want to start stop working right uh, right it's, it well, just always seems to be like that yeah i mean the reality is uh it takes a lot of uh preparation i mean we uh, i spent probably a solid three or four months doing setup with a team of people who were very capable very smarter than me about doing setup and everything but uh you know, it does require a uh, dedicated set of people who know what they're doing to, to work with us. Uh, you know, yeah. we set it up at a time when um, coronavirus, the, the you know, the, right. the virus had just right. started COVID and we had to cancel our trip down there. And so we had to do everything remotely, which is, to, I mean, I was really nervous, right? We didn't really know what that was uh, going to be like. Right. Uh, but yeah, it is. Uh, and especially when, when, when things go wrong. I can't just walk over to it and yeah. fix it or check it or do something. So yeah. it's a problem happens and you know, it might be three, four days a week. You right. Know, right. Gotta help you if you get, need a replacement part, because then that's probably a month or so at least. Yeah. Or do you have somebody down there that can, that can uh, go check on it for you or yeah, do you have yeah. to schedule well, we do, a trip? We do have, there's, there's a team of people who work there and I think there's somebody who's around the clock at night. Um, uh, okay. So if something happens, but uh, you know, I had an issue where, uh, I had a focuser uh, from Plane Wave, I mean, very, very nice, very expensive focuser, and uh, one of the pinion gears broke, and mm -hmm. uh, they had to go and find it uh, and figure that out. Because I'm saying, hey, the focuser's not working. I don't know what the problem right, is. Right, right. They had to pop it open eventually, and then we ordered a replacement, and that took you know two, three, four weeks, uh, you know, getting from Plane Wave up here. I think they're up in Michigan, I think, or something. Wisconsin yes, they are in Michigan wow. now. They used to wow. be right here down, like yeah. right next to Celestron in Torrance. But yeah, they moved out to Michigan. Right. So it just takes, it just takes a lot, right? You have to be a lot, you know, you have to be a lot more patient and you have to kind of just 
realize that it's not always going to happen. Uh, and in astro night. camping, like uh, Edward said, you have to just make sure you have backups, you know, yeah. just have backup cables and all that. So you don't. Yeah. It, it's like you can try at home <laughs> and get it absolutely perfect and know everything is working absolutely perfectly. And then you get somewhere where the humidity, the temperature, everything's different and you know, you're starting over again. So right. yeah, I've, I've done a couple of these where, uh, where, where the fun and ex of the experience was hacking with the technical stuff and find that you didn't actually get an image by the end of the trip. It, but uh, right. it's still fun. You kind of have to, I think to be, I think to survive in astrophotography, you got to really like the, the hacking on the equipment as well as getting pictures in the end. Cause if it's just about the pictures, you can get really frustrated. Right. Um, so Edward, let me, I have a question for you and I don't want to burn too much more time because uh, I know you're going to go through your intro. And we want to get to the, yep. to the meat of things, but um, you, when you, uh, go astro camping. I mean, you have a pier at home, right? So clearly you're not mm. bringing that. Is this a situation <laughs> where you uh, have a separate system that you take out or do you actually disassemble thing off your pier and go and kind of what's your experience getting ready to go and, you know, getting it's that, both. Get going? Um, earlier on, um, I had one mount and then it was take it off the pier and then remount it. Um, until I got my, uh, until I got my low Smandy mount, it was a, a CGE uh, mount, uh, similar weight capacity to the G G11 that I would take on and off, but to go on a quick star party type of trip, I would take a second mount, the lighter weight uh, GM8 is what I would normally right. take for Super that. Portable. And right. I left the big one on the, on the, uh, on the pier, mainly because I usually do my polar alignment by drift alignment. Um, to just, I don't know, old school, I guess. Um, and so that does take a little bit more time right now. I can't actually see the, the North area around the uh, North star anymore because the trees have kind of grown up. So, um, the, the, the kind that points in that area is, uh, no longer, no longer usable. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I've done it both ways. Um, I think the most embarrassing version of that is, is getting pretty much all the way to the star party site, which is about two hours away and realizing, darn, I forgot the counterweights. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's trying brutal. to decide whether I wanted brutal. to trying to decide whether I wanted to hack something by hanging some rocks on the counterweight shaft and decide, no, well, let's just, let's just <laughs> use the binoculars tonight. All right. <laughs> Skip all the equipment. Um, so I think the ultimate version of, a, of a astro camping was our, our venture back in 2012. We took the GM8 up to the top of Haleakala in Maui um, to see the uh, transit of Venus. Um, wow. This was a, a place we could actually image. see yeah. it beginning to end uh, in the continental United States. You couldn't see the end of the transit. Mm. Uh, so this is a picture of the final uh, contact at the end of the transit Amazing. and uh yeah that 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 was a whole different set of challenges that was your brain doesn't work at ten thousand feet and so you know setting up your mount and basic things like uh, how to start things up that you're pretty much really familiar with you forget oh, wow. <laughs> when your brain isn't working so that so i spent a lot of time you can see me fiddling with this stupid thing That's uh spent a lot of time recentering yeah, it wondering what was what is wrong why isn't this mount working and realizing it after the end of the day 10 hour day or whatever it was that i forgot to move the latitude on the mount to a completely different latitude we were right. at it's so, oh, completely right. blanked out before. on that step oh gosh so that was our that was our i think that's our biggest uh biggest that's venture okay. away from home with uh with the uh, with the equipment very cool so that's kind of a brief introduction. Um, okay. We're going to get to the automation with Nina bit. And um, I think the first thing is to mention how I got started in, in, in this. Um, I, I've had various software over, over time that is capable of automation. But to be honest, I never really fully automated anything because one of my problems was that the scope uh, needs refocusing frequently as the temperature drops. And um, I had never gotten around to getting an autofocuser uh, for it. Uh, again, mostly that cost thing. Um, and so I didn't see any point in doing full automation since I needed to be out there uh, a number of times in the night to refocus anyway. Okay. Um, same with the Meridian flip, I'd be out there anyway, so I might as well just do it by hand. Right. Um, earlier, um, I, I put together a project uh, called My Focuser Pro 2. I found this uh, online. It's a do-it-yourself 
uh, Arduino based focuser and where you provide the Arduino and the stepper motor and uh, the gentleman who provides this has the various schematics and uh, it's a really, really thoroughly done DIY project that he has. Mm -hmm. So I did some 3D printing of some enclosures for it and uh, mm -hmm. put that system together and mm -hmm. uh, put that on the feather touch focuser. You can kind of see the uh, Franken uh, box on the side there, mm -hmm. but it is solid. Um, it's a, I'm able to do it without actually any half stepping or quarter stepping on the on the stepper motor uh, it's a, a nema 17 with a planetary gear i think a 27 time reduction um gear on there so it's it's a it's kind of a beast of a stepper motor I, do you still and use that can, yeah i and it and it uh it holds wow. the pay it holds the payload awesomely and uh it's a very well featured uh ascom based system so nice. Having put that together um, and now having actual auto focusing, I kind of went in search of software to do the full automation. Um, and um, that's how I kind of came into looking at Nina. I'd had Maxim a long time ago, but I don't have a license for that anymore. I kind of looked at SGP. I played with Ecos a bit, uh, but I kind of wanted to stay on a Windows system since I got a lot of other stuff that's on Windows. So I looked at Nina and uh, that's, that's one of the things we were going to, uh, talk about today. So here's kind of just a list of the things that that I actually found check boxes for me on Nina. One of the reasons that I, I kind of invested time looking at at this and, and learning how to use it. Um, obviously, one really nice aspect is that it is free. Um, so is no, nice. no, up, no upfront cost to get to get going. And it's a very active development group. They are actively improving and 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 upgrading it um there's a very active forum um but unfortunately it's kind of a it's called a discord system it's it's more like getting customer support on twitter rather than getting it on a on a forum it's a little frustrating in that sense but um a, a lot of developers working on that right um, and it's really it's actually it's if i if i if i remember correctly it's open source right so or is it open source it it, it is yeah it's certainly managed by their architect. It is, you can get the source, you can jump in and become part of the project and, 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 and edit that. In that sense, it's open source in the sense that, that you can get access to the source. I haven't actually checked what the licensing uh, arrangement is around that, around whether somebody else could fork it off or not. Um, I, I, I didn't pay much attention yeah, to yeah. that. Yeah, now, now that I think about it, I don't, I don't think it's open source in the, in the traditional sense of you can download a copy or download the source and do your own thing. But es yeah. essentially, the, the, the thing is, it's free, right? Yeah, it's free and it's actively being developed on. So those, that that's that's kind of important. Um, it it also it also supports all of the devices that I have through mostly through ASCOM. Um, you know that kind of the ASIAR Pro that you were showing is kind of out of the uh, out of the question for me because I don't actually have any ZWO uh, right, devices. Right, right. Um, so that's not really that's not really something for me to to look at. Um, yeah, I did want to point out. So, so one of the, I mean, I know I mentioned this before, but one of the drawback, well, sort of limitations, I wouldn't say it's a drawback, but it really is designed to support ZWO only. hardware only. So if you yeah. have everything, you know, ZWO camera, uh, ZWO filter wheel, but you have, uh, you know, an Optech focuser or something else, it's not going to work with, with uh, the yeah. ASI Air. Right, right. Yeah. So that's a, that's a bit of a limitation that, that, makes that something that I can't really uh, consider. Um, got great integration with uh, external guiding. I've always used PHD. Now we have PHD too. Um, and uh, it, it tightly integrates and manages PHD too in the background. We'll look at that real quick. Um, it automates the autofocus as part of the capture sequence. Obviously this is true of a lot of capture software. Um, it does, a, in, in my opinion, a very good job of autofocusing. One of the big things that I like about it from that point of view is that it autofocuses on the images you're actually capturing. So it doesn't have to slew over to some special star to put a batten off mask or some other process like that. It just gathers HR, HFR statistics on the images as you're collecting them, decides that you are now getting out of spec or that the temperature's changed or whatever you want to program, and then actually does the focus without having to slew the mount off the centered target that you've already played Saul. So that's that's kind of a nice, nice. thing. Nice. That is really nice. That actually, it, so let me ask Edward, because in, uh, I use Sequence Generator primarily, yeah. and I'm starting to use Nina more. 
Um, but you'd mentioned something about autofocus in, in sequence generator and a lot of other systems. Your options for invoking the autofocus are temperature change, certain amount of time passing, yep. a certain number of frames being shot. And you're saying yep. that with Nina, it will actually, you can specify things like uh, if the half flux radius gets above a certain number yep. or something exactly. like that. Or so, a certain percentage or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so that's actually a little bit more directly tied to kind of, you know, what are, what is my imaging results? And it seems like a better, a better approach. And you can, we'll look at the sequencer really briefly in a kind of a little overview of the screen. So you can kind of mix and match those. That's very flexible in how it, it handles the programming of the sequencing. Um, it does the automated Meridian flips. Obviously, that's the kind of the, the keystone of this conversation is to look at how that works, um, but does that as part of the sequencing in a very flexible way. Uh, it does plate solving for um, the centering your target, syncing the mount, and you can pick and plug in your favorite plate solving, either local or blind solver um, sure. that, that you, you prefer, either talking to the internet or you can bring it all online uh, onto your local box so that you can do that remotely in the field without an internet connection. Right, um, but I think, I think ASTAP is really the, that, that's the one that kind of everyone's gravitating towards and especially yeah. the kind of the free software, free Nina. Yeah. ASTAP is also free and it seems to be kind of the, the, the one of choice right now. Yeah, and and that's 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 what they recommend as their sort of their top one. I think that's probably, I think I'm I'm using that for the local. I don't remember what I've got set up for the blind one right now. Um, another big thing is the dome control. Um, that's actually only supported in the newer version of Nina, the the pre pre release version. Um, they are re they've got a production release of 1.10, 1.10, and they are currently working on the pre-release of 1.11, and the dome control is in that, um, which is one of the reasons that I'm actually on the uh, nightly builds. That and um, the, I think the Meridian flip parameters are more flexible and easier to use with Gemini than they are in the original 1.10. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And a really big one, is the rich sequence handling. The sequencing engine is really uh, well featured um, and that's completely been revamped in the 1.11 release. So that's well, another reason that's well worth looking at that release. Yeah, so the this, original, by the way, the original version uh, of Nina didn't have a sequencer at all, right? As I, as I recall, and they added that subsequently and now it's being even more refined. Yeah, it's, it's yet, yet again rewritten. And in fact, um, my understanding is that if you're on 1.11 and you use you can use the the previous sequencer from 110 they now call it the simple sequencer but it's actually been rebuilt on top of the engine of the new sequencer so um, we'll, we'll take a brief brief look at that um, just to kind of show you the system that I'm using from a connection point of view uh, because I'm going to jump over to my other little remote uh, PC I'm using a small um, mini PC to do all the Astro stuff this is something that that I found from my experience is that trying to do that on the same laptop that I'm doing other things like image processing Word Excel office stuff is usually a problem because I'll, I'll invariably change something when I'm not astro photographing that breaks something. Um, mm. So having a separate PC for all the astro stuff kind of keeps everything isolated and sanitized in a, in a bucket that you can kind of treat as an appliance, kind of like making your own air, air ASI Air Pro kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, this particular uh, unit uh, has uh, several USB 3 ports, a couple Ethernet cards, and, and Windows 10 Pro. I do all my connection via a remote desktop, which um, uh, come, the server part of it comes in the Pro version of Windows. And right. I, I've, I found that a more reliable than some of the other uh, freeware uh, remote desktoping, mostly because it natively picks up the resolution of whatever device you're viewing it through, rather than seeing a picture of the desktop on the remote thing. It just project. It's like you plugged in your laptop as the as the monitor on your uh, remote PC, and it takes advantage of whatever screen size that thing has. Right, oh, and, nice. and bigger. And, big and, Edward, briefly, very briefly, what are kind of the rough hardware specs on this uh, laptop? You are not the laptop, but the little mini computer that you're using here. This one is um, an eight gigabyte RAM, uh, about a two gigahertz 
Intel Celeron i7. Uh, I don't remember. It's got some special number, J4125, I think, but I, I, I might have that wrong. Um, four USB 3 ports, although all my devices are USB 2, um, and two independent network cards and plus Wi-Fi. So that gives the three different channels that I can get in on that. And that's plenty to run um, the full Nina stack, all of the hardware. I usually run a planetarium and a planning software in the background as well, but I don't do any image processing on that. It's just the data capture piece. Right. Um, so and I, I wanted to point out that this is not a uh, hugely powered system. And I think there's a lot of people who are a little bit confused, I wouldn't probably not confused, but there, there's a lot of confusion out there about okay. how powerful of a system that you need to do this kind of desktop, or sorry, not in desktop, but telescope top uh, type of computer. And, you know, Edward's Celeron processor is just, I mean, that's not an eight gigs of RAM. That's just not a lot by today's standards. So right, you know, right. the image acquisition portion of things, uh, you just don't need a lot. You just don't need a lot of uh, horsepower. Nice. Would yeah, you agree? probably probably the operating system is is chugging a lot more than uh, than the Nina stack. To be right. honest, um, there's not really a lot going on in terms of processing. There's plate solving is a little intensive, um, but I really I don't I don't see any any problems with this with this power of a machine. It it it's it's been really nice. I've had other other versions in the past, but these have really come down in price. I paid two hundred and fifty dollars for that. Yeah, that's astonishing. So. That's that's that that makes that really well worth doing, because I had been debating whether to upgrade my laptop, which is no longer Windows 10 compatible. Um, didn't ma doesn't matter. I could just remote into that from any of my devices, including the iPhone, actually. Yeah, that's um, great. The other thing, the other thing, I I connect to the uh, to the Gemini system with Ethernet cable, and I do it on a dedicated network. I don't go through a router. I have a crossover cable that goes straight from the mini PC to the Gemini, and that's all that's connect. on that network. Yeah, yeah it's a direct connect um, with hard coded um, IPs, and I I also do that with the laptop that I have at the mount. Um, another on the other. Uh, on the other network card, another crossover cable to the laptop. Um, and then optionally, I, I, I connect to a router either at home or even astro camping if I'm close enough, if the RV is close enough, I can set up a little router in there. Sure. So that's the basic setup. So what we'll do is we'll kind of um, log in to, the, uh, to this device that I've got sitting on my desk. I pulled it off the mount and brought it inside. Um, and I brought the Gemini uh, head across and kind of dummied it down with terrestrial tracking so that I could bring it in without the motors. Nice. So let's, let's basically switch over and have a quick look at, uh, at Nina itself. If that, uh, yeah. that sounds let's like take a good a look. idea. Let's do that. So just, just while you're, while you're setting this up. So now we're actually going to go, this is a live, uh, kind of view into this mini computer that you normally use for your imaging yep. and all this it's, 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 a, it's, uh, it's live. It's working right now. Yeah. And so I've got the, I have the telescope um, controller attached, but I didn't bring in any of the other equipment. So, sure. um, and again, the, the point here is not to, to give a tutorial on Nina. Um, there are a lot of really good tutorials uh, online. And I, I, I think I should give a shout out to uh, Queeve the Lazy Geek. Um, I think he's got some really good ones. Um, he's actually a contributor. I think he wrote the uh, autofocus module that's, uh, that's in there currently. Yeah, um, he's, got a YouTube, he's got a YouTube channel. We'll put a link yeah. to it below, but he's got a ton yeah. of YouTube videos on all sorts of things, uh, yeah. astronomical that's related and astro imaging. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And he did a number of presentations at a tutorial level, and there are several others that I that I won't go through that uh, that have gotten uh, given tutorials on on Nina, the sequencer engine that uh, that I encourage people to to look at. Um, what well, what I thought we'd do is just kind of give an overview of what the what the system looks like and some few gotchas and things that I've experienced with it. Sure. Um, so this is the Nina screen. I've launched Nina from the from the from the icon and. It, kind of comes up in this form here. Um, and as with many other tools of this nature, it's an all-in-one application where you spend pretty much all of your <laughs> night's activity in that one application. Um, and even the PhD2 activity is hidden, can be hidden behind Nina. You can go to PhD2 through 
and look at its screens or you can just kind of see the progress of the guiding through Nina and you know not not substantially different from other other tools of this genre right. uh, down along the left side is the sort of the main like I call them workbenches the kinds of the, the main activities you can do uh, the first one is configuring your equipment um, a sky atlas a, a framing assistant a flat panel wizard manager the sequencing engine your imaging view and where you can manage your uh, options and settings for the system and they have also introduced a system of plugins uh, on this release that i have re really played with that uh, allow third parties to kind of add some additional functionality mm -hmm. that don't require that you know can be done outside the normal release right. cycle so if we look at some of these, so for example, on equipment, if you click on that, you get a subset of, you know, these are kind of like their tabs. These are all the equipment pieces that they support. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see all your major, all your major uh, candidates here, camera, filter, wheel, focuser, rotator, telescope, guider, um, switches that you might have for a remote operation, a flat panel, if you've, if you've got an ASCOM version of that, um, access to weather uh, services, dome control and then if you've got like uh, rain or cloud monitoring safety equipment um i don't i don't have all of those i've got about i use about half of those right um so to look at an example if we jump down to telescope um uh, and we'll we'll actually do a connection um it doesn't look like anything's happening but you do get a picker for the various ascom or native drivers that you've installed i've, I've got basically Gemini installed, uh, but they've got some built-in simulators as well mm -hmm. that you can use. Um, so you can press on the, the cogs to bring up the ASCOM picker dialogues that you might set up initially. Um, once you've done that once, you don't do that again. You just basically power on that piece of equipment and it brings up the drivers in the background, the hand controller, however you've got your Gemini.net set up. Right. And nice. then shows that you are all connected and ready to go. Um, it's pulled across the local sidereal time from the uh, Gemini um, ASCOM driver. Yes. And then it is checked whether you're at the same location. And if you're not at the same location, it asks you who wins. Do you want to, do you want to, do you want to push your Nina values down into the mount or do you want to pull the mount values up to Nina? Um, as we look at the meridian flipping, it is important that you make sure that your Nina and your Gemini are agreeing on where you are and when you are. Um, because if they don't, that will introduce differences in when we think the meridian crossing occurs and a lot of problems occur if everybody's not on the same page. Right. So, so Edward, uh, let me jump in because I just want to clarify. So when you say um, we're trying to get some agreement, um, you're, I'm gonna, what, what I think that means is so if you travel someplace, yeah. your computer settings are going to be updated uh, date or time or certain, you know, location that the way the computer accesses it. And then when Nina connects uh, to your computer, uh, to your ASCOM driver, it actually reads in that information from the telescope that's in the Gemini and compares that with the values in your computer. And therefore, if there's any distinction, it will say, well, well, these don't match. Do you want to use the ones in the Gemini or do you want to use the ones in the in Nina? And it will just kind of make sure that whatever that whatever you choose, both those systems have the same values, right? Yeah, that's correct. The slight, the slight correction on that is I'm pretty sure that it is caching the site, the lat latitude and longitude in Nina, not picking it up from the computer. So I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, tinkering with the computer settings or your, your locale or whatever don't have anything to do with Nina, that it is the fact that you moved to the other location and that when you got there, you reset your site on your Gemini hand oh, okay. controller. You know, and you went in here and you you said, I'm now not in Hollywood, I'm in somewhere else. Mm -hmm. This will make sure that Nina is picking that up as well. That's probably the more common way to go is that you've changed it on your hand controller and you're bringing it into right. Nina. So, but, so, but, I, but that's an important point is that what you're saying is if you travel someplace and your uh, location or time is significantly different, you want to set that up in your Gemini correctly before you connect to, to Nina and that Nina then, when it looks at the values that it saved last time it connected to the Gemini, yeah. it will look at the current Gemini settings, but those have to already be updated, right? That's how I would do it, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah. Um, and it's easy to disconnect and reconnect um, any any of your equipment on the fly. Um, there is a master power button down at the bottom here and that will connect all of the equipment that you have set up. So the normal evening activity is open up Nina, hit the power button, everything's connected. Obviously, you have to have all those things powered on to start with, but that's the normal. Right, the like normal, the focuser and the yeah, camera all, all and everything the, else. All those things have to be ready to go. Um, but it's bringing up the drivers in the background, as you would expect from any other ASCOM-based sure. system. So if you click Guider, Guider, I've got set to PhD2. And so if I, if I, if I power that, um, what we should be happening is, uh, is that PhD is getting launched in the background. And I'm not even sure what it's going to do with nothing connected here, but uh, nothing like Turns a live open. system to take that out. So it looks like we've got the uh, the PhD two has been brought in into the uh, brought to life, and we're now connected to PhD two basically. So from now on, you could just look at at graphs over here and not not have to necessarily look at the PhD. Switch over to the PhD screens. Right. So this, uh, provide, the, this is not uh, th this is just a window into what PhD is doing for convenience. But Correct. the real, the work is still being done by the PH2 application uh, in the background. Correct. And the reason, like with other applications, that this integration is important is around dithering. Uh, because as you're sequencing exposures, it's Nina that will be in charge or whatever application you're using on the front end that's in charge of saying, I want to dither between these two frames and we'll send those commands down to PHD to, to do the dithering. Okay. Got it. So, so the um, so the the dithering control uh, is is uh, is something that you set up in Nina as well. We not necessarily go through all those, but you can see on the screen that there's various settings for how you want to dither that are being forced down into PHD two to to have it be the engine to do the work. Right. <laughs> So that's some of the equipment. Just quickly looking at some of these other bits and pieces here. Um, there is a fairly comprehensive atlas of different uh, uh, targets. Um, you can search them based on their whether they're up right now, how big they are, how bright they are, what kind of thing they are, a whole bunch of different uh, choices that you can make in here. I use this a little bit. I still use Sky Tools uh, Pro as my kind of planning uh, Atlas program, so I'm I'm having having you know cut over to this completely. Uh, but one interesting thing to point out is in these graphs for each of these targets, um, you you see the normal. It's showing you when the thing rises and when it right. sets. But the funny little graph below, the little blue graph, that's actually the horizon at my observatory. Oh, um, wow. So that's I can awesome. take the I can take a CSV file that represents my horizon and point Nina to it, and I can have several that I can point at, um, and have it show the actual horizon in the atlas. More importantly, when it's doing the sequencing, the sequencer knows that information. So you can say things like, I want to start imaging M33 when it comes above my trees, not above the horizon, because yeah. no point in doing it when it's still below the trees. So that's a, that's a, a nice, uh, a, a nice add-on. It's pointing at the same one that I'm using in Carte de Ciel that I, that I, I mounted into uh, to that planetarium software. And it looks like that bump there is probably some big tree that you've got going. Right? Yeah, unfortunately, this bump right here has gotten bigger and <laughs> it now covers the North Celestial Pole. That is, yeah, a big tree. Uh, yeah, not a good enough of a tree monkey to go up there and whack off the top of it. So I live with that for the moment. Mm -hmm. So the framing tool, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Atlas allows you to kind of figure out what you might want to look at. And if I pick one of these in the list, um, let's say this one, I can send, I can do various things with it. One of it is send it to the framing assistant, which we'll look at next. This basically jumps down to the framing tool, which is this next one. Mm -hmm. It takes a minute. What it's now doing is it's going online to the, I've configured it for the NASA sky survey. It's finding the thumbnail images for that target, bringing them into a framing assistant. Um, and it's the internet part of this. It's a little slow. I should have done it with a local 
But it, but this portion does uh, require uh, internet access, so you can't be doing this out on a, a remote site with no internet connection. Is that you correct? You can if you don't have it set to NASA Sky Survey, but have it set to one of the offline ones. Uh, that takes some additional configuration of your Nina to bring in the the database files that have all those thumbnails. Right. Their instructions are pretty clear online for how to do that. The the documentation <laughs> Nina provides uh, for their released version is actually quite quite good, although it's not uniform and in, in depth. Uh, some sections are more comprehensive than others. Okay. The pre-release software, well, it's still being worked on. So uh, caveat emptor on that part. Um, so this allows you to do things like uh, deciding that you want to do a mosaic and choosing the amount of overlap you want, being able to kind of frame and decide where you want to move that, and then being able to send the centers of those targets over to the sequencing engine as, uh, as a piece of information you can use over there. Nice. So that's what... Uh, that's what the framing framing assistant, the flat wizard. I haven't used this much. Its main purpose is to you put your luminescent panel uh, to take flats on top of your scope. Um, I have a little one that I've made. Um, it doesn't have. It's not ASCOM driven. It's it's just got a switch on it. So I, it, not much benefit to this. But what this tool will do is also slew through different exposure links, trying to find the ideal exposure link to put the peak at the roughly the center of your histogram. Um, once you figured out what they are, you just kind of memorize those numbers and then I don't bother with that anymore. But that's what that that's what that does. I'll come back to the sequencer last because that's kind of the most interesting bit. Um, the imaging view, you can see each of these views brings up different collections of, 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 of frames. This is where you spend most of your time during the evening. This is where you see images coming in as they're being captured, watch the guider behavior down here. Um, see what's going on with your focuser, watch the HFR changing over time on the frames that are coming in, look at the statistics, you know, whichever of these little widgets you want to bring up that you want to monitor on a continuous basis, you'd be doing it in that screen. You can also do the normal take interactive shots. I want to take a six minute exposure or a six second exposure just to see how my framing looks. You would do right. that interactively through here. You would go build a sequence to do those interactive tasks. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a uh, set of options, general configuration options that you can uh, set uh, for the application. Sometimes it's a little confusing to remember which of these things a particular options in, but poking around on these on these you'll eventually find it. The the one that's going to be interesting today is this one. So I found that under options imaging and it's meridian, the, the meridian flip, flip settings, settings right. So this is where we're going to spend a little bit more time today looking at how to set these because if getting these set to match and be consistent with Gemini is, is, is the goal of what we want to accomplish. So we'll come back to that. Um, other things you can see very a lot of flexibility on being able to define a file name schema that comes out. This is really useful if your image processing software would like to see the files named a certain way so that it can kind of auto categorize things different programs have different ideas of how to group and name things, you can dial your own here to pretty much meet any criteria. So that's kind of helpful because there's some stuff happening with um, Pix Insight lately on doing yeah. some uh, file naming conventions yeah. that could potentially automate some of the work you're doing for yeah. calibrating and integrating and, uh, and getting your imaging done if you're using Pix Insight. Yeah, and getting your calib the right calibration <clears throat> frames to go with the right light and uh, frames right. based on folders and file name conventions. So this gives you a lot of flexibility to set that this up to match whatever you're you're sending down the workflow chain. So last thing is sequencer. Um, the sequencer allows you to use both the old simple sequencer. Um, I'm not actually going to show that. Um, I was going to look at the advanced sequencer. Um, opens up empty, allows you to load in sequences that you've already defined. So we'll look at a simple one that I built to do H alpha images on M17. Um, in fact, this is the sequencer that I used to generate the image of M17 that we saw a few slides back. Um, so those, those kind of match together. Right. So this is an environment where what you're getting in the middle is a sequence of uh, basically a, a list of boxes that can 
be nested within each other. And each box represents an activity that's occurring sequentially in time. Typically, these are grouped into observatory setup activities. Uh, then individual targets that are being imaged here, I just have one of them. And then finally, observatory shutdown at the end of the day uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. Each of these little blue things is something from over here that you've kind of dragged over. So it's a drag and drop environment. Over on the right side is all the nouns and verbs that you might want to stick in your little visual program. Um, so for example, you might want to cool the camera. Run, you might want to run a set of instructions in parallel. Uh, you might want to close or open the domes, take pictures. Um, so all the things that you might want to do are represented over here. As well, all the conditions that you might want to test while you're running are also predicates over here. For example, um, ha has the target gone below some minimum altitude, at which point I want to stop imaging, is one of the tests that you can drag in here. Yeah, you'd mentioned earlier an example test of, you know, you wanted to start an imaging before uh, when it gets uh, above the tree. And I'm assuming this is the kind of thing where you would do that. That's correct. So, for example, on my uh, on my target, um, let's see, what do I have on this particular one? Um, this M17 target, uh, there is an outer box that represents the target itself in which the coordinates were placed. Those could have come from your framing assistant. You could have pushed them across. It's reminding you of where you are and what's going on. And within that, I have several tasks. One is a prepare target task. And in that are the following activities. I want to stop my guiding. Um, I want to wait for that target to get above 20 degrees altitude. Um, so that's an example of not starting that target until some set of conditions are met. Um, I want to turn on tracking sidereal. So various things that I want to do. Um, and then I want to run an autofocus at this point. It's reminding me hey, the camera and the focuser are not connected, you're not going to be able to get that task done. So you can look and can tell the devices you need to accomplish this are not connected or not running right now. That's what those little warning signs are for. Um, when you get to images, take images is, a, is a, another box that I dropped in here. And each of these activities has three parts to it. It's got instructions that you want to do. Here, all we had were instructions. But in addition to instructions, it's got triggers and looping conditions. Right. Looping conditions are things that you want to check every time you finish one of these steps to decide whether you should continue or not. Do you continue? Do you loop back and do more of them? Or are we done with this box? So in this case, I've dropped in. I want to loop until 530 in the morning. I just happened to pick that. And since I wasn't sure, I said, also, I don't want to go, uh, I, I, I want to end as well when the altitude is below 20 degrees. And so we will say if either of those conditions is met, either it's gotten into the trees or the sun is going to rise because that's the sunrise time, then stop looping this thing, we're done. I didn't have to go figure out what the actual times were for each of the exposures. I just have to say something about uh, yes or no. What do I want to have done? Triggers are things that are checked every time you do something, but they're not about stopping the looping. They're about inserting other activities. And meridian flipping, our friend, is one of those things. So this basically says every time through this box, every time one of these is done, it will check, should we meridian flip or not? Are we at a place? in the sequence where Nina believes we should meridian flip. And if so, it will do that meridian flip activity and then continue on with the activities that it had before. And the fact that it will plate solve after a meridian flip is actually part of the configuration of that meridian flip gesture or noun or whatever you, verb, you, whatever you want to call right. that thing. So Edward, let me ask. Um, uh, it, so I know we are going to go through in some detail about the meridian flip and automating that. Is the advanced sequencer, ver, you know, compared with the simple sequencer, is that something that's actually required uh, to use no. the Meridian Flip? No. Or is it, no. can you do it with either one? You can do it with either one. And the settings, <clears throat> the settings are the same. They are the ones that we saw back here on images. Um, where did I see that? Options, imaging. These settings here apply to both sequencers. The difference being, 
the flexibility in how and when you can invoke the meridian flip and other such triggers and gestures. The main difference is that the simple sequencer is a little bit more canned in terms of its workflow. Uh, it has a more fixed idea of which things should be checked when and what should you be allowed to do at what time, whereas the advanced sequencer is much more programmably flexible. And with that comes... Uh, a, a bit more of a learning curve, right? Because my, my my reaction to so I you know I use Sequence Generator Pro, right? I can I can do many of the things. It doesn't have kind of the fine grained, yeah, uh, control that you're describing. But many of the things that I needed to do, of course, it it does. Uh, yep. And you know my reaction to this is you know wow that's just you know there's so many things in there and so many of these things could be configured incorrectly or set up incorrectly. And it just seems like it's going to be a nightmare to get through all this. And I don't, I don't mean this as a, as a dig against Nina, but in your experience, you know, using the or simple sequencer before, and now, you know, of course, you have some familiarity in using the experience with the advanced sequencer. Kind of, what's your experience of that? Yeah, and and, and my mileage may vary on this for a couple reasons. Um, first, let me interject one one nice feature here is that you can prepare, and it comes with prepared templates where when you say, I want to image um, M17 from somewhere else in the application, you can, you, you can pick a template that you want to do that with. In the simple sequencer world, that template was hard coded. You couldn't pick one on the fly. But once you pick that template, it basically has populated this the same way, just with M17 stuff plugged in. And you can make your own templates by saving one of these out as a template. Um, so that's, that's, that's observation number one. Whereas on the simple sequencer side, because you've got less degrees of freedom, it's more about picking the kinds of exposures and the order you take them. And some of this, when do you check other things is, is more canned and maybe a better place to start. That's why they haven't removed it yet. Um, the, 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 but the other half of that is, first of all, my background is control automation. So to be honest, my biggest frustration with all the automation and image capturing tools that I've played with is they're not flexible enough. Um, they really want you to take a series of exposures and then maybe loop that game over and over, but being able to do things in between and in different ways, you end up having to exit out to bat files to do things. And who's got time to write bat files when they're in the field? Yeah, I agree. Um, this to me was a godsend have the flexibility of a drag and drop environment that got me the flexibility. There's a number of things in here that I can't do the same way um, in, in, in other programs. Um, and I've used the simple sequencer in Nino less, but I've used other applications that I don't really want to knock uh, here in this podcast. But that, that was my big frustration was less the learning curve than, oh, darn, I can't do that either. Um, so that that's a trade-off um, and the the learning curve is well recognized to be larger on this advanced sequencer all the tutorials online will Got say it. say something to that effect. okay well th thank you for just kind of yep. comparing the two because it does <clears throat> you know um well let me i guess let me ask this so as we get into the to the details of the meridian flip um are you saying that if you're using nina can you use either the simple or the advanced sequencer and the things that we're about to learn and do are going to work on either one regardless or do you actually have to use the advanced sequencer on this yeah and then i'll and i'll further break that down so there are two versions of the software in 1.10 you only have the simple sequencer in 1.11 you have the simple and the advanced sequencer so that's choice number one what we're going to talk about today is specific to 1.11, not because of the sequencer choice, but because of the Meridian flip settings themselves are more flexible in wow. 1.11. And I'm going to cover them as described by 1.11 because I think it's going to be, it, it, it is more flexible and it's, it's going to fit better with Gemini. Okay. That said, you could still do it with the old software if you really didn't want to go on to the advanced, uh, to the new version. Right. However, once you're on 1.11, the Meridian flip, everything we're going to talk about next can be the advanced or the simple sequencer. There'll be no difference. Got it. But you, but you, so I, and I, I hope I'm not stealing any of your thunder, but I think you, you, one of your recommendations is you want to be 
on 1.11. I mean, 1.10 will work, but probably 1.11 is really where you want to be to make your life simpler. Yeah, to make the meridian flip configuration simpler, I would I would recommend being on 1.11. Okay. okay. And um, you can make it work, but some of the right. material we're going to look at, you won't be able to set that up. Uh, it doesn't have as many parameters. It's got basically there's two parameters on 111 that are only one parameter on 110, and that difference is kind of important for Gemini. So Nina dot one dot eleven. That's the one you yep. want for for this. Yep. All right. So any Brian, do you have anything else you wanted to bring up on the kind of the Nina overview screens? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll kind of switch back and look no, at some, I mean, again, some more was, diagrams. This was, this was sort of our notion was to kind of just give a brief review of Nina, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Um, and I think talking about the details of what versions uh, are important to use is really helpful because you know, one of the issues that I have and have not adopted Nina as much is that when I get into remote observing and remote observatories and things, you yeah. know, you try, try to get everything working and then you lock it down. And they were doing these yeah. nightly builds all the time. And yeah. it was just, it was just hard to, hard to keep up with. And there's were, a lot, they were fixing bugs and things <laughs> like that. And, yeah, I, and just, that, I just, that's I, a, that's a really good point. <clears throat> yeah. I could, um, and I maybe do that. So maybe spend a moment talking about that a little bit more. Cause that's a really, a really good point. Um, so again, you can configure Meridian flipping slightly less flexibly with 1.10. The big advantage there is that it isn't changing. Um, and so you have what is considered a blessed production release. And in theory, they've removed all the bugs that they have that they know about for that release. So for an unattended remote observing, um, that that has that has advantages. And the documentation is also more stable for the the production release right. um, on the nightly builds. You don't have to move to the next nightly build. It doesn't ever automatically update you. You can get one that works and then you can stick with it. I stayed with one particular version for, you know, three months um, because it had what I needed. And I've recently bumped it up just to, uh, to, to see where we were at and nothing of the parts that I cared about had changed yet. Um, so they recommend, Nina recommends that you stay up to date with the nightly builds, but it is not a requirement and it's not enforced on you. So right, you, you, got it. you could, you could treat it as kind of a pre-release, but you know, if something doesn't work, well, yeah, you are on the edge. Okay. Fair enough. So let's, uh, cause I know you did want to spend some time going through, uh, you know, the, the Meridian flip stuff. And I, I want to make sure that we have enough time to get through all that and not burn up your entire afternoon. So let's, uh. Let's get let's get to that part because I think it's yeah. uh, I think it's a fantastic presentation, and not only talks about just Meridian, but just talks also about kind of how Gemini works and how uh, the relationship between really any mount software, but in particular, of course, for us particularly for Gemini, right? Uh, and the imaging application, and again, this is specific to Nina, but I mean it's true for any imaging application. Are all going to kind of work together, and it's up to us to coordinate that. So probably the first place to start is to just get a bit of the nomenclature, uh, because I don't know, I, I, I find the whole west side, east side of the mount really confusing sometimes. Um, and that becomes pretty important with Meridian Flipped, especially when reading the documentation and know what, what we're talking about. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at a couple cartoons of uh, a mount. Uh, Northern Hemisphere, very little changes in the Southern Hemisphere, but I will mention it. So in this cartoon, you're, you're standing north of your mount, looking back down through the optical tube, which is pointing roughly towards the, towards the pole. Uh, the North Pole. Obviously, if this is in the Southern Hemisphere, everything's reversed. You're looking, now you are looking north, standing on the south side of your mount. So for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, if you're standing this way, on the right, on the uh, left side is the Eastern Horizon, on the west, on the right side is the Western Horizon, and stars are going to appear to move this direction. That direction flips, in the southern hemisphere, it appears to go this way, but it's still going east to west. Right. Um, that's the, the only really thing that changes is the symmetry. Nothing about the arguments we're going to make actually is different between the two hemispheres, because they're all about whether you're on the west or the east. 
they don't really care whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, other thing to remember is that the stars are appearing to move across the horizon at a little less than four minutes a degree. The sidereal tracking is like, I've written it down there, 3.9891. So it's a little short of the four minutes per degree mm -hmm. um, that you would expect. Also, just as a note, this, this line here in the cartoon represents the celestial equator. So in a sense, this whole image is kind of tipped forward. You're looking not only south, but you're looking downwards a bit through your optical tube. Um, and then if you're looking in the sky, as you go further west, you're looking in the direction of decreasing right ascensions, because the right ascensions roughly Th that that coordinate system is all about what time of the day things cross the meridian. Okay. okay, so now typically we start our imaging pointing to the east. Uh, if we're going to image overnight and care about a meridian flip, then we're probably starting pointing to the east. But in this configuration, our mount is on the west side of the mount. And that's always really confusing because you look at the telescope picture and you go, Oh, but half the telescope's on the east and half of it's on the west. How do you know it's on the west side of the mount? Um, the trick that I, that, I, that I remember this by is just point the telescope at the meridian. Just rotate only the RA axis, point it at the meridian, and now it's pretty obvious which side of the mount the telescope is on. It's on the west side of the mount. Right. So we um, do, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term called pier, you know, what's the pier side? So this is um, pier side west and there's pier side east. But those, uh, the, the other confusion that happens is that pier side west means you're imaging the eastern side typically. Not always, but yeah, you're typically like that. doing that and, and of course vice versa. So imaging on the east or pointing at the east, pier side west or mount is on the west side of the pier. And that, that is a little confusing. Again, just mentally rotate the RA axis only and don't touch the deck axis and you'll get your visual answer. So here we're pointing exactly at the meridian, the counterweight shaft is level, the scope is pointing up, the declination axis may pick some various places on the meridian. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we get to the meridian flip. So now we've moved a little further to the west. We are now imaging on the west and we are west side of the pier. And this is when we are approaching a place that we might consider a meridian flip. The reason we're doing a meridian flip is because that camera is going to smash into my pier in a bit. And we want to get it over on the east side before that happens. Um, to be honest, if your mount can rotate all the way through the meridian, all the way back to the western horizon, and all the balancing is perfect, and it doesn't really matter, you know, you've got good guiding everywhere, then don't do a meridian flip. Just let it track all the way around. Um, meridian flip introduces more complication, requires a plate solve or recentering, but this is the luxury that most of us don't have to be able to image all the way around. Yeah, so I... Um Ever, let me just jump in with a couple of comments here be, uh, because, you know, th there are mount like uh, the alt as mounts uh, when you use with a wedge for imaging can actually track all the way through a meridian. Okay. And, and the question is sort of oftentimes is like, well, what, why is the meridian so complicated? Why, why is it so fascinating? <laughs> why are we all spending yeah, time like, on this? Isn't it like the best area of the sky to shoot that is 100 percent true 100 because that's the point I've right learned. when you're shooting directly up right there's the least, least amount, amount of atmosphere, atmosphere. and mm -hmm. it's the clearest uh, there is and t oftentimes uh issues with you know you have mount tracking issues or balance issues things right. like that oftentimes they're the least problematic uh when it's pointing uh directly up so it's basically prime it's prime imaging, imaging. time. And oh, we want yeah. to maximize that as much as we possibly can. Right. So a lot of people have opinions about how to how to do this. You know, do you, do you want to kind of do the meridian flip before? Do you want to kind of do as much as you possibly can through the meridian and then, you know, flip it at the last minute? Okay. But the point is you really want to think about this because it's such great it, it's it's the best imaging time that you have available and you really want to make sure that you're taking advantage of this. Right, right. Not just the automation part. Yeah, and unfortunately, sense. it's the best part of the sky and the math and the geometry says it's the more complicated and problematic part of your mount geometry. That's what so it seems of course like. It yeah, is. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> those two line up with each other. So then the, the meridian flipping problem. 
So, it, so on this picture here, we're assuming that we're about ready to, to flip the mount. And all flipping means, just to make sure that we don't overcomplicate that, is we're going to spin both the deck axis and the RA axis 180 degrees. The mount is going to do it in such a way that it minimizes tangling up all the cables and hitting things. And the net result is we're pointing at the same target on the west, most likely. But more importantly, the mount is now east of the pier. It is mm. pier side east. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about what actually happens when Nina commands that to happen. Um, did it do a go-to? Did it use a special flip command in NASCOM? And Brian, you had some thoughts on that. I thought maybe you could jump in a little bit about what's going on with, uh, with exactly what's happening with the actual command. Yeah, so... so you know, and you and I had discussed this briefly. Um, the thing is, ASCOM as a standard has been around for quite some time. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the earlier mounts um, didn't have a lot of sophistication. They were primarily for observing, and then they kind of got into astro imaging. And um, so when the ASCOM standard was born, um, it kind of had to... I don't want to kind of how I say this. Like everyone had to kind of agree that it was a good thing to adopt. Right. And no one wanted, none of the mountain vendors or anybody wanted to say, well, you know, my mount because it does X, Y, and Z, uh, but doesn't do something else. Well, we're going to, we're going to be out of luck on this. So they had to develop an ASCOM standard that, right. you know, worked more or less with everything uh, that was out there. Um, so the way that they kind of envisioned a, a Meridian flip happening was that, um, at some point, you know, and, and we looked at uh, Edward's slides, so I'm just going to point out again, right? In this target example that we're looking at, when it's the target that you're imaging is just past the meridian, at some point you're going to say, like, I want, now's the time I want to be uh, flipping okay. around. Okay. Um, and ask them, you'll just issue a go to. When say go to the same target, and the mount's going to figure out that it needs to basically say, hey, I'm going to go to this target, but I need to go to it from the opposite side of the pier, right? I got to rotate everything around and make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is, it's kind of it's kind of a vague roundabout way of figuring out if there's a flip needed or not. And there's a lot of, you know, I think a lot of people kind of struggle with it failing and not sure why and all these things. And so, they added this notion of, uh, so ASCOM as it was, it was evolving, uh, added this notion of um, having an explicit peer flip. So I want you to go to this target and there's sort of a, like, I want you to flip the peer when okay, doing this. Okay. Um, and that's, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, right. of course we want to kind of do that. Um, but um, it just has never been fully adopted by the controlling application. Right? The imaging applications control this. So a lot of people are confused. They think uh, the mount controls this. Well, actually, the imaging application decides when to do this, and the okay. mount decides if it's actually capable of doing okay. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are a couple different ways within ASCOM to do this. One is you issue a go-to at just the right time, and then the mount knows that that needs to do a flip, or there's an explicit flip command that happens. But the problem is it's a very uneven implementation, both in the mounts and in the software itself. Okay. Um, so I think for the moment, uh, and again, I'm no, I'm certainly no ASCOM expert here, but I think for the moment, kind of most, most imaging applications and the way people approach this is it's going to be uh, issuing a go-to. Okay. And then the mount's going to sort of figure out if it is uh, going to do that flip or not. Mm -hmm. Some applications, and I don't, I don't know what Nina does here, but, but I think what they, I think some applications are starting to do now is kind of take both approaches. So they're going to issue a go-to. If they detect that a flip didn't happen, they're going to try it again with the explicit flip command. Okay. And uh, if that works, uh, then great. Uh, you know, we're kind of moving on. So it's the, the challenge is kind of that uh, we're in this sort of morass of, of supporting older <laughs> approaches and technologies right, right. Uh, as well as trying to support newer things. I, I think, you know, my, my prognostication here is that things are going to get a little bit better, but it's still going to be kind of messy for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of what, what uh, Edward, what you and I had been discussing, because you were mm -hmm. saying, well, what, there's this flip command. Why, don't, why doesn't everybody use it? And that's, right. there's some historical aspects to that. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, that's helpful. I think what we'll do here is we'll just we'll we'll talk about it um, from the point of view of a go to and what has to happen, because I think it's easier to understand what we're about to talk to from the point of view that Nina is going to issue a go to back to the same coordinates. Uh, and, and we'll just ignore for the moment the kind of other things that may or may not be happening um, in, in that communication between the two. Yeah, and I want to point out, by the way, that um, this is the, the stuff that we talk about, uh, you know, what's explicit flip command or whatever, that's all behind the scenes, right? To us, average Joe imagers, uh, Joe or Josephine, of course, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, that's all hidden behind it. But it's it might be helpful to understand a little bit about that because... Uh, if it fails, you'll have some idea of kind of what's going on. And, and Edward, I know you're going to get into some of these details, yep. but yep. Um, this is the kind of stuff that's going to be really helpful in your next set of slides. It's going to help clarify what's going on. Yep. So assuming that a flip did happen, um, and that's the goal of, of the rest of this, is to set it up so that we have higher confidence that it will happen. Um, that at that point, you can now continue tracking your target all the way down to the western horizon from the east side imaging towards the west with the mount on the east side and you've got all the all the runway you need you're not going to hit anything at this point so that's the goal of a meridian flip is to allow us to image from the east through the meridian which is our prime imaging area continue that down into the west and minimize the interruptions that have to happen around the meridian and ideally have that all automated so you can go get a nice night's sleep right so yes the, the, the trick here is that we, we saw when we were looking at the screens for Nina earlier that there was this section called Meridian Flip Settings. And there are also a, a set of settings in the Gemini controller. This is the safety limits. And these are the two pieces of information that are kind of they're kind of trying to describe the same thing. When should flips happen? And when should we stop because we're going to smash into things? Both of these settings are about that question. The problem is they, 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 they describe the problem in completely different ways. And part of the challenge is to understand how to do the translation between these two worlds to get them set up consistently. So as we look through this, we're going to be looking at only three of the NINA parameters, the minutes after Meridian, the max minutes after the Meridian, and the pause before Meridian command. Um, I will interject a note that in NINA 1.10, you don't have this thing called max minutes after Meridian. You have only a thing called minutes after Meridian. The problem is I'm pretty sure that what it means is max minutes after Meridian. So they changed the vocabulary between the two releases. This is actually the better vocabulary. Um, so another, another caution about the older version. On the uh, Gemini side, we're going to be concerned with the Western position or the Western safety limit, as we usually call it, and the Western go-to limit parameter. These are the two things that are going to have to collaborate with these guys over here. Um, again, the goal here is that Nina is going to schedule images and ideally will schedule them across the meridian so that exposures are being taken as the mount crosses the meridian to get that prime real estate in the sky. And it will decide when to issue a meridian flip sequenced in with all those exposures that it's doing. And we want to make sure that when it does that, Gemini is configured such that it will honor that flip at that time. And the reason is because you've got one shot only. Once Nina says, hey, flip, it assumes the flip happened. If Gemini is ready to do that flip five minutes later, Nina is not going to try again five minutes later. So that's, the, that's our goal here is to get them consistent so that when this thing issues a flip, this thing honors the flip. Right. And right. I want to I want to point out. So I want to point out one other thing about this, because there is some confusion uh, about uh, uh, the limits. Right. You're, you're describing something where these two systems are, are, are kind of used different ways to describe similar concept. OK. Yeah. Um, but in the, the limits that are set. Right. We have a video on how to do setting your limits. Those are those are physical safety limits. You're not adjusting these to try to figure out your meridian flip. You're yeah. setting these uh, so that stuff doesn't crash, crash into, into your it, pier, yeah. right, right? So right. your camera doesn't smash into your tripod or whatever. The only thing on the on the um, 
Gemini side that you can sort of fiddle with is the Western go-to limit. And it has to make sense in the context of the existing limits that you've set, the safety limits, and they're called safety for a reason, right? There's Because yeah. there's your safety, right. you don't want to yeah. smash your gear. And all these Meridian flip settings that you have uh, that we're, we're going to talk through in uh, in uh, Nina. So, excellent. And the problem we have is that we look on this side and we see things that say minutes and seconds. And over here we see things, well, we're not sure what they say, but we look it up and it's degrees and arc minutes and so what am I supposed to do these don't look in it these don't look like I can move any of those numbers over here or vice versa so how do I configure these to work together they are in different languages um, I think the first thing that uh, I, I, our, our, our viewers should do is go back and look at the documentation for both of these systems and I've put the links here for the places that you should go to the Gemini 2 documentation online at that location is very in depth about what all the definitions are, but it may take a couple reads through to get the vocabulary right. I think actually this this presentation will help you with some of that vocabulary. Likewise, uh, the Nina 1.1 and 1.0 uh, versions, those are the current locations online to get the relevant documentation um, and and uh, you come back to this this part of the video to to sure. see what those are. You yeah. might post those down in uh, yeah, we'll put them in, in, in the in the in the video when it goes online. So let's let's look a little bit closer as these two languages that the two things speak to, to get that cemented down before we talk about how to interchange them. So the first thing is how the Gemini system works. It is based on angles, rotation angles relative to the counterweight down position. Counterweight down position means you're either pointing directly east or directly west at right. zero degrees. And when you are uh, programming the Western position or the Western safety limit, the number you're putting in here is degrees and minutes. And it's an angle starting on the Eastern horizon and working its way over to the Western horizon. Typically the number you put in here is going to be a little bit bigger than 90 degrees, 90 degrees being the meridian, because it represents being able to go a little past the meridian tracking. Right. And the I Eastern... Can I just Go point ahead. something out, Ed Edward? Because that's a great point. Sometimes people have telescopes or setups that for whatever reason, uh, their Western position in setting the limits doesn't allow them to go e even to 90 degrees or, yeah. or past 90. It might be something less than that. And the, the, the problem with that type of system is that you're not able to get to the meridian yeah. And therefore, on the flip side, you're not going to be able to, if you were if you were able to flip it, you're not going to be able to, to reacquire that same target. And, you know, the first kind of aha moment you have is those, both those numbers need to be above 90 degrees and, and frankly, well above 90 degrees in order for meridian, automated meridian flips to work. Yeah. Now, I'll, t I'll, I'll take a slight exception to what you said to make it work and to be able to le leverage the meridian skies. Um, when we get to the last slide, I'll show you how you can configure Nina to work and take advantage of the skies on both sides and just lose the meridian window, but still be able to automate across the meridian by just kind of warping over it rather than traversing through it. Right, um, so, so your and, point, uh, I'm sorry to interject, but, but yeah. I think that's a good point, right? When we talk about a meridian flip, uh, I, my exception was talking about where you want to reacquire your target as quickly as possible to maximize yep. your time at the meridian. Yep. And your point is, hey, sometimes it just that's not possible to do, but you can still automate a meridian flip. You just yes. you might be giving up some sky time to do that, and that's a great yep. point, right? So yep. don't yep. give up if your limits are, you know, kind of you just have a really long telescope or whatever. There's still some opportunity for you to automate here. Yep. And I think, but going back to your earlier point, I think you should start with the assumption that you would like to get both the Eastern and the Western position number bigger than 90 degrees so that you get overlap on the top. That'll make your life a lot easier, not only for automation purposes, but just to do go-tos interactively so that you can actually reach the meridian targets and look at them and to be able to not have nuisance flips because you move, you know, one degree over and it's not oh, going to flip again. Um, so that overlap just makes your life a lot easier. Consider anything else only in the, in the case when you're 
peer tripod system or your, some weird telescope that doesn't allow that at all. Um, and I think if you're doing a lot of imaging, I think your next step is probably to figure out how to fix the geometry on your mount with extensions or whatever to get you that meridian time. The more the more you can move those western and eastern safety limits away from nine degrees, the better this all all works. Right. But as you mentioned earlier, the you don't you don't you do that first as a safety limit, and then we tune it for meridian flips. And I'll make that point again in a moment. So again. For Gemini, everything is in terms of degrees and arc minutes. That's what you're entering into the controller. And depending on whether you're entering the Western or the Eastern number, it measures from opposite directions. Right. Nina, completely different story. Not that one is right or one is wrong. They're both really based on the same information. But here the vocabulary is different. Everything you're configuring is in terms of time since you've crossed, since the target has crossed the meridian. So you notice these are all in units of, of time, minutes or seconds, um, mostly minutes here. So here, what we're concerned with is once your target has crossed the meridian, how much time has elapsed? Well, we know we're tracking siderially. So how many minutes have elapsed sidereal? That's a one-to-one -one relationship with the number of degrees. So they're really the same information, but just in two different vocabularies. But that's important to remember that Nina wants uh, integer values of minutes for these arguments. They're going to correspond to safety limit values that are done in degrees, and we're going to figure out how to automate converting between all those things. So it's a bit of math that goes on. And yeah, it's kind of a little bit, it's not hard, but it's error prone. So I put together a spreadsheet that, that I shared with the, the user group. Um, it's posted on the user forum. And basically, there's a couple of numbers you enter that will go through the procedure for, and it will tell you some numbers back that you'll type back into your application. So it will take care of doing not only the conversions, but figuring out the best practices and making sure you have the right amount of cushion and padding and dealing with some round off errors that occur. Right. So this me, is a great tool. So yeah, it is. This so, is amazing. But if you can back up one slide, let me just point out something that, you, that you're... Uh, it, it, there's a sort of a key in here and that's in the lower left that uh, every f roughly every four minutes, I know it's 3.9891 is a degree of rotation, right? So in terms of uh, the, the celestial sphere. So if you're talking about four degrees past uh, the meridian in terms of time wise, right? Uh, sorry, well, let me pick a different so, Let's say you're doing 12 minutes past uh, okay. the meridian. That is going to be roughly three, three minutes of time. Did I screw that up? Three degrees. Three degrees. I'm sorry, right. three, degrees. three degrees. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Three degrees. So there is that number, 3.9, let's call it four minutes of time, of actual temporal time, equal to degree of rotation, is kind of the heart of, of translating between these two systems. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. And that's what your spreadsheet does. It helps that. And it, it, yeah, the, the, the mm -hmm. rest of the spreadsheet is, it, there's a lot of issues because the numbers aren't going to be perfect. You're going to have a little bit of error in your location and your times. And you, you, you really want to have some safety padding between the numbers that you compute on both sides. So you can have yet more confidence that your windows match up. And I'll show a picture that I hope will, will cement that in a couple of slides here. Sure. And so we'll put a first, link into your spreadsheet, by the way, in the description. Okay, and then we probably can uh, we can probably prune out just these these slides and and make a, and drop those in the same place. So number one rule, Brian, you already said it before. The first thing you do is you set up the safety limits on your mount, and the safety limits are basically illustrated here. Um, if you are pointing to the west, and your telescope your mount is still on the west side of the pier, at some point you're going to smash your equipment unless you've got a really, really nice setup that isn't like mine. Um, maybe a very, very short telescope and uh, a pier, uh, who knows? You can, you can configure your geometry. Most of us are stuck with this situation. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to set your west and east safety limits. What is shown here is setting the western safety limit. For the eastern safety limit, it's mirror image this view, 
track back to the east and figure out where you'll crash on the eastern side of the pier. However, for meridian flipping and automating a night's exposure, the eastern position actually never comes into play. That is only when you're doing a go-to or a slew back manually towards the east, and that's not what's happening during the course of an automated night's activity. With the exception of changing targets in the middle of the night, and going back and picking an earlier target that makes you go back to flip them out the other direction, which you might automate in Nina. But for your normal tracking through the meridian, it's the Western safety limit or Western position. And Brian's got great videos on this. Basically, you're going to move your mount to a position that's close but not hitting. You're going to make sure that the deck axis uh, will that you can move the deck axis and still clear your pier. And then you'll push a button, set limits here, and it'll program the Western safety limit for you. Right. At that so point, we'll put it, we'll put in a, we'll put in the link to the, to the tutorial video we have on how to set the limits on your Gemini. But that's, you know, step number one is basically you have to have your limits defined because those are your safety limits. And, and as you mentioned earlier, you are not tuning the Western safety limit to make your meridian flips work. You are changing the way your meridian flips for work to honor the Western safety limit that you have put in there based on the geometry of your mount. Right, great point. Um, so the um, in in this example in this cartoon, we've we've we, it's at one hundred five degrees. Um, this is kind of roughly where where, where mine is at um, Eastern safety limit. We'll come back to this Western go to limit later. This is a really confusing way of thinking about things, but it's just the way Gemini does it, and we'll. This will be the last thing that we program um, after we've done some of the Nina parts. So sure. we've done the Western safety limit. We've entered that into the hand controller. And now we got to figure out what to program next. So the step two is that we now need to tell Nina, how far into the West can you do exposures? That sounds a lot like a Western safety limit. It's basically how far are, is Nina allowed to keep the mount tracking while it's making exposures before it says, whoop, stop. We need to go back and flip or pause or whatever because we're going to hit the pier. Well, that is Nina's idea of the Western safety limit. The way we're going to do this with the spreadsheet is we'll go to the spreadsheet. We'll read off the hand controller, the 105 degrees and zero arc minutes. That's the value you saw back here, mm -hmm. degrees, arc minutes. You put that into the two cells in the spreadsheet. And one of the things that it will give you back is Nina's max minutes after the meridian. This will not be exactly 105. As shown in this cartoon, it will be a little earlier than 105. So the spreadsheet is trying to make sure there's a bit of cushion between these two things because there's differences in timings and you just don't want to run right up against the Western safety limit because once your mount goes into the Western safety limit, it changes behavior. It now, you need to slew it back out of the Western safety limit to get it to operate as you would normally operate. Um, and so we want to get Nina to be a little bit more conservative. This value is what is called max minutes after the meridian. And so you take that spreadsheet number, you put it into Nina right there. So That's Edward, I, I just want to clarify, you, you, and you bring a good point, right? You don't want to tell Marina, oops. <laughs> oh you sound like Tanya. I know. You, you don't want to tell Nina that the maximum imaging time is right all the way to your safety limit. You want to yep. put a little padding in there so that it doesn't hit that. But, uh, but your point is, I, th I think what you're saying is your spreadsheet actually kind of does that. It, you're putting a little cheat in the spreadsheet to yep. give you that padding automatically. So that's correct. Pretty, that's correct. Yeah. That's, okay. that's one of the things that I, I found that I needed to automate for myself was putting in that little bit of padding. Got it. I mean, we had a conversation on the forum where somebody was not bringing their mount to the same degree of levelness each time. And that little bit of difference in levelness after they do their cold start sync and all that means that the timings of when you hit the mount are a little bit different if you've rotated your tripod a little bit it's going to hit the boundaries a little earlier or later and yeah. so this is this is just one of many reasons that you want to be a little bit more conservative on the image acquisition side of things okay. now the the other thing to note from this picture is really important about a couple things i want to I, I want to bring up first of all um 
what I'm doing is I'm looking at a zoomed in view of this little arc view. So we're looking at a meridian crossing and time is progressing and angles are progressing. That's what we're showing by this little now linear graph. So here we are at the meridian. We've got our Western safety limit a little further down the road here. We've programmed this max minutes after the meridian a little earlier. Now let's see what Nina is actually doing. It is actually scheduling sub exposures, however long or short you've decided to make them. And it is scheduling them up to and through the meridian. So it says, yep, I can still fit one. Yep, I can still fit one. Oh, if I actually start that exposure, it's going to end after max minutes after the meridian. So it will never start that exposure. Instead, when it finishes that exposure, it will pause the mounts tracking, just because that's a really good idea to just stop motion, right. and wait until the criteria for flipping are met, which we'll talk about in a moment. And when that occurs, it does the flip, starts things back up, reacquires the target, and continues injecting sub exposures, but from the east side of the mount. So the critical point here is that Nina is leveraging and most of the parameterization is about leveraging as well as possible imaging through the meridian. You don't have to think, to be honest, am I taking six minute exposures, 30 minute exposures, 30 second exposures? Should I change my meridian settings? Nina's taking care of all that. Um, you, your, the choices that you make up front in configuring Nina are safety limit and what we'll look at in the next screen. Does so that make sense? A, so Edward, that's a great point because one of the things that you're illustrating is that when we're thinking about meridian limits and, and doing the meridian flip, it's not like we have an infinitely uh, refined scale in which we work with. We're dealing with chunks of imaging time. So basically, right. if you're imaging every, you know, if you're doing a sub exposure of five minute or 10 minute increments, every five minutes or every 10 minutes is the opportunity to evaluate whether to do a flip or not, or say I'm yes. not able to continue on. So, you know, and most of us are imaging kind of those time frames. So it's not like there's an infinite number of opportunities for Nina to evaluate when to do this meridian flip. Yeah. And the other thing is you can't really anticipate when in time they will do, they will happen. The, the other thing that's not obvious from this image is that, yes, we know that we've configured an exposure to be exactly 30 minutes or 30 seconds long, but you don't really know how much time happens in between these two because what what could happen is it could say it could look at the hfr on the last image and go oh my god i need to refocus and so it's going to take a moment to do a refocusing run and that may take a couple minutes or it may decide nothing needs to happen it'll go straight on to the next exposure so this scheduling activity is very dynamic in nature it's figuring out as it goes forward based on what it needs to do i'm about ready to start another exposure can i stick it in or not yeah, and, there, and that, there, there are other things that happen too. I mean, if you're imaging a target multiple nights, that target is slowly moving eastward at the starting point, right? So it's not like, uh, you know, all this is um, just fixed and, you know, Nina's doing the same calculation every time. It's, it's balancing many, many of these right. uh, variables mm -hmm. on how to figure out when is an appropriate time to stop and when is an appropriate time to do that meridian flip. So the, 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 the other... I think kind of important conceptual thing to get in mind is going to be this, this concept of an earliest meridian flip time. This is the second piece of information that you as a user need to choose freely. The first one was actually the Western safety limit, although there really wasn't a lot of choice there. It's based on the geometry of your mount. This one is a degree of freedom that you might think about a little bit, which is what is the earliest amount of time after the meridian occurs that you would like a flip to occur? You could set this, it's, it, there's a lot of angst about choosing this value that I've seen, and it's not as critical as all that. Um, I set it typically a minute or two after the meridian. The important thing to understand about this value that we're picking is it is not the value at which a flip must occur. It is the time after which a flip is allowed to occur. So you, it is perfectly reasonable for Nina, if you say my earliest flip time is right here, for Nina to image right on through 
another 20, 30 minutes of imaging, go all the way right to there before it decides to flip. But it is not allowed to flip before it gets to that earliest meridian flip time. Why would you set that to be anything other than zero? Well, there are, there are, there are a couple reasons. Um, one is that you'll find that this is going to help program the Western, safety, uh, Western go to limit. It's kind of analogous to it. And to be honest, we really want to keep a little bit of overlap in Eastern and Western go to's around the meridian. We don't want to configure things such that there's this abrupt change where you can only get to certain targets from one side or the other. We want near the meridian to be overlap so we can slew and go, I'm sorry, go to from, from either side of the mount. Right. Uh, second, some now we get into a lot of reasons that might have to do the, the idiosyncrasies of your own system. Your plate solver might have problems. I've heard reported around the meridian. Some other mount drivers don't work very well flipping near the meridian. Your geometry may not actually allow you to physically do a flip right near the meridian. So there are reasons that you might want to avoid having all that mechanical thing happening right when you're at the meridian. And this degree of freedom is how you can pick that. I recommend, and I default in the spreadsheet, a minute or two. Um, what you are not having to do is figure out, well, I know my subs are about three minutes long, so I really want to make sure I get a full sub after the meridian, and so I want to make this big enough to fit it. You shouldn't be thinking about any of that, because this is not when it will flip, it's when it's allowed to flip. That makes sense? The earliest point that it's allowed to flip. Earliest point. Right. It's not the latest point that you can make a meridian right. flip. Right. So that's, so this is an important concept, because meridian flip uh, so, sort of the system being ready for a meridian flip is not a point in time. It's a range of time. It's a range of and time. And this is, it, it, we have to define this both in Nina and we have to define, or actually well, it is defined in Gemini through the Western limit and the Western go-to limit, which I'm, I'm sure you're going to get to here in a sec. Yep, exactly. And the next slide will show those windows explicitly. So, the way you should, and, and by the way, so you, you pick this, this number, you can pick any number you want. I, again, I recommend, you know, a minute, minute, and a half, two minutes, something like that. And then you plug that into the, into the spreadsheet. You know, I've color coded the spreadsheet. So you type in the green things and it gives you back the orange thing. So this is another green thing. You put that in as the desired meridian flip time or earliest meridian flip time. And here, 30 seconds turned into half a minute. And it will give you back the other important Nina parameter called minutes after the meridian. You will take that number and you will plug it here in the Nina configuration. This number has been sanitized. You know, you're not allowed to put fractional things up here. So it figured out, well, what whole number of minutes greater than zero, blah, 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 subject to round off. It basically makes sure that whatever it puts here is a little later than whatever you said here. So once those two numbers, the 59 minutes for we had for max and the one minute for the earliest are typed into Nina, we have to find the window over which Nina will execute or request a flip. It will basically never flip until it reaches that point, And it will never do exposures that go beyond that point. And this is the region in which it's, all of this region is up for meridian flipping based on where the exposures happened to land as it was, as it was generating them. Right. So given that, now we gotta make Gemini play on the same scorecard here. And so that's that's where some of the conceptual things get a little weird. But this is actually this is actually the only thinking you really got to do. And again, I've got I, I still recommend don't worry too much about it unless the geometry of your mount or something about the software is giving you issues right around the meridian, then pick a minute or two. Now step four is it's to get Gemini on board. And we're going to work our way towards programming the Western go to limit because that's fundamentally what is equivalent to this value back here. The earliest point that you could meridian flip is fundamentally what the Western go to limit is all about. It's just that you program it in kind of a weird way, but it is trying to tell you the earliest point at which a meridian flip is allowed. The documentation of Gemini says that if you try to go to a target and it is 
earlier or closer to the meridian than that western go to limit bound would put it it will slew there um, it will it will get there by slewing if you're on the west side if your target is on the west side beyond that western go to limit then it will force a flip to the east side before it goes to that target right force a um, meridian flip that's correct force a meridian flip or at least be on the east side um, that if you're already on the east side, obviously no more meridian flip, but it will force a meridian flip. So the key thing to understand is that Gemini has already got this idea of when it's going to honor a meridian flip and when it's going to do things as a slew without flipping or go to without flipping. And uh, we want to make sure that the, that that both of these guys are playing the same game. So let's let's follow the spreadsheet for a moment and then we'll come back to that. So having typed in the previous two pages of information the spreadsheet will also be giving you back the western go to limit as degrees and arc minutes so 1447 your task using the spreadsheet will be to take those numbers and plug them right in there now what happened what did it do well basically what it did is it looked at the nina window that you got from this previous activity and it will find a point that Gemini should flip that is a little bit earlier than when Nina might ask for a flip. So it will find that absolute time or absolute angle for when Gemini can start doing a flip. Now, unfortunately, this value is, is very natural to think about, but it's not what you get to type in here. You get to type in the difference between the Western safety limit and the point at which Gemini can start doing a flip. Right. In so in our in example, degrees and minutes, right? in degrees and minutes. So not only do you have to think about it as a difference, you do need to make sure that you're thinking about it in degrees and minutes. So when you do the subtraction, you got a little bit more math to do. But that number, exactly as shown in the spreadsheet, you put it in here exactly as shown, and you should get the behavior. So now what happened behind the scenes? So now the top part shows where Nina might command a flip and the window below shows where Gemini will honor a flip. So if, if your target that you said go to is here, it, it, will, it will take you to the east side of the pier. It will flip to the east. By the way, if you do go back and shoot a target right here and say go to that target, we will force you to go to the west because that's on the other side of the eastern safety limit. The weird thing is the bit in between. This is the this is the no man zone. This is the zone that if you shoot a target and go to it in between here, it will stay on the same side as it already is. So the thing we want to avoid is for Nina's window to exceed back over here where it might command a flip and Gemini's not ready to do a flip yet. It will try to it will slew there and game over for the night's exposures. So let me let me just pause for a moment, and I'm just gonna flip to me because I because I, I'm you know trying <laughs> trying to mix up some of the, the video here, but um, I want to kind of summarize this because this is at the heart of I think the the realization that people need to have about this, and that is it, it's the following right that uh, a meridian flip has a range. There's a range. It's not a time. It's a range of time in which the Gemini is able to do a flip based on the limits that you've set. And when Nina is, when you program Nina to say, I want you to consider doing a flip in these in this range, right? So you have two different ranges and they have to, number one, agree with each other that these ranges, uh, we both agree that this range exists. Okay. And the added little bit that you put in here that you're kind of putting into your spreadsheet uh, is that, to be safe, Gemini's uh, range should be a little bit wider than what Nina commands. So no matter what, any time that Nina's going to figure out when to do this meridian flip, Gemini's going to be ready for that. Exactly. That's a good way of summarizing it. And so these little, we, we've called these little cushions, amount of cushion that you want between these two endpoints so that um, you can account for, you know, things that are different from night to night 
leveling of your tripod times are a little off between the, the Gemini box and the and the controller box um, location we talked about on the forum but that should be fixed by synchronizing it when you connect um, right. so that you get them to be at the same latitude and longitude I want to I want to um, point something out this is a, so your uh, th this example is kind of roughly based on your setup right yeah um, so it's a very typical setup. I mean, you got like, I think a 130. And so it's, you know, it's not some miraculously small or miraculously big telescope and setup. These are very reasonable things that I see. It's pretty typical. Um, so people will go and they will set their limits in their Gemini, you know, their, their, their safety limits. Again, we have a video for that. That's pretty easy to do. So that's fine. And then they will go and program Nina and say, here's where I want my you know, minutes after meridian and max minutes after meridian, okay. and then it fails. And the question yep. that they always say is, well, well, what happened? You know, something blew up. And the thing is that Western go-to limit, the default value is I think two minutes, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds or something like yep, that. That's okay. correct. And so the, the, this screen is really, really important because if we were to do a calculation or show this graph based on the default Western go-to of two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, It'd be way that, over here. It, it would be over there. It'd be this little tiny sliver at the end. So, you know, 80% of where Nina thinks it's okay to do a flip is going to result in a failure. Right? Okay. All right. Exactly. So this, this to me, this screen is like, man, you've really got to nail your Western go-to limit. And in using the spreadsheet example you've done, um, it's really going to make sure that it matches up uh, between Gemini and uh, the Nina uh, uh, settings that you put in there. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that, that a common mistake is to ask one's peer, um, hey, can you give me a good set of settings so that I can use that? I'm going to type in your settings. And the problem is that unless your Western safety limit is the same as their Western safety right. limit, all of the other parameters are completely meaningless. Right, right. They all, they all follow through from where your western safety limit is and everybody's is a little different so mm -hmm. there is no right set of parameters you either use the spreadsheet or you follow this sort of reasoning to get at what are a consistent set of values for for your system right so again you might ask somebody what is their western go-to limit and kind of ask about their their knowledge and things but you always want to be setting your eastern and western absolute limits depending on your telescope because if right. you just take that and you randomly type in numbers you run a pretty good risk that you're going to bang your camera into the mount and it's going to keep going. And you don't want to do that. You don't want that to happen. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> Fortunately, I was there to watch it. <laughs> uh, the learning process. Okay. The last slide is what I mentioned earlier, Brian. This is the, this is the, um, what happens if you just can't get through the meridian at all? Um, and this might be a situation where the geometry of your mount is so extreme that you can't even approach the meridian, never mind image and track through the meridian. So Nina does have a way of dealing with this, but as they point out, and as we should reiterate here, this is a last resort uh, type of uh, type of situation. This is not something that you should commonly do. And it's all about configuring this pause before meridian value. Notice it's before, not after meridian. Um, and normally this will default to zero. Zero means off. Zero is a special number. It means ignore this slide. None of what I'm about to talk about will happen in Nina. If you type anything, a positive number, then what we're about to talk about happens. It's basically says, pick a number of minutes before the meridian and don't allow any exposures to go past and enter into that region. This becomes an absolute forbidden zone. So if you have, if you were thinking about starting a 30 minute exposure right there, which would have ended here, it won't even start. It will pause the mount right here and it's pause, not pause imaging, pause the tracking, stop tracking. Right. So at this point, the mount has not actually even got close to the meridian, which is good because something's wrong with your geometry that you don't want to allow that. Okay. And I want to point out when you say, so you keep using this term like, you know, something's wrong with geometry. What that really means is 
your telescope is so long that it's just going to bang into the so mount long. that much earlier, right? Yeah, it basically says that if I put my telescope vertical pointing at the meridian, that my camera is already hitting the tripod legs. I, I don't even have that much room. I actually needed, I need to back it out even more to even cr uh, clear my, my my tripod. Or maybe you've got a pier with a desk. Uh, I can think a lot of a lot of situations. But really, the right answer is you probably want to see about fixing how you're mounting everything. But given that you don't. This is what you can configure in Nina. You can tell it, look, just we're going to give up imaging that prime sky real estate altogether. We're going to stop tracking the mount here or wherever the end of the exposure that got closest to that dead man zone is. And we're going to just sit there and Nina will sit there and let the target, not the mount, but let the target cross the meridian. This is another confusion that we've had in the forum. And let me back up here where I mentioned that at the end of the last exposure that you are allowed to do from the west side of the mount, Nina will pause the tracking. It will stop moving the mount. And the confusion is, well, if it's not moving, how is anything going to happen? The key to remember is that the target is still moving. Earth is still rotating. Right. The thing that you want to flip and reacquire is still is moving. Still moving because Earth is still rotating. So that thing, that target will eventually meet the requirements for a Gemini meridian flip and a flip will occur. And flip means reacquire the target, not reacquire where you were paused at. That's right. a subtle but really important point. That applies here too. We've stopped, we've paused, the mount isn't moving, the target RA coordinates continue oh to God. go over and eventually Brian, they get far enough on the other side <laughs> that we can get Nina at that point mm -hmm. to say flip reacquire but now the flip doesn't require being close to the meridian it can do it and 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 never approach the meridian uh in in where it has to point at because neither the beginning nor the end were anywhere near the meridian right so, so more chance that it will clear so let's just talk about what exactly this means and the reason I cut to you eating your popcorn what you're doing now what is else because I can I be hear doing? it oh, I'm sorry so but, but let's, okay, this slide is a second example of how to set up uh, Correct. the Meridian Flip. If that first one worked for you, and this is going to be the case, this is the thing that we all aspire to, your first settings. Yep. We want to image in the, we want to image at the Meridian and through the Meridian. We want that prime real estate. So if that first one works, then we're done. We're done. Okay. This particular example, this slide is, I, I don't know where she's going, uh, but this, this particular slide is your, your setup is such that you can't do the first one. Correct. Okay. So then, and this is the thing we talked about earlier. If you cannot image through the Meridian, is it still possible to automate the Meridian flip? Correct. And your answer previously yep. and you're demonstrating now is yes you can but what's going to happen is Nina's essentially going to stop the telescope from tracking wait for that target to get past the meridian and past you know whatever whatever it needs to get to and then it's going to you know basically flip the telescope and reacquire the image and continue on you just kind of lose out on this prime real yeah, estate because of what you are uh, telescope, uh, you know, and setting, you know, the, the, the physical limitations of your setup yep. are, and that's just kind of how it is. But this is a great example of how you can actually still automate. Correct. Yeah. And, and again, last resort. Um, so the default, uh, the default, you should, you should aspire to having zero in that slot uh, so that it turns this behavior off. Uh, because we don't want, we don't even want to pause at, you know, zero might look like, well, pause when you get to the meridian. Well, that would kind of be, well, you have to flip at the meridian. That's exactly what you don't want to do. You want Nina, as we showed here, to be able to capture through the meridian as seamlessly as possible. There's nothing magic about flipping at the meridian. As you said, it's a range. 
the meridian is just where the math flips over and where the symmetry flips. It's not the place that you should flip. It's like, we really shouldn't call it a meridian flip. We should call it a switch to the other side of the pier somewhere near the meridian flip. Right. And for, for some people who are really, they want to get fine tuned. They want to do, a, they want to maximize this prime real estate because the absolute best is directly up or directly straight yep. up. Right. And, and the, whatever that is, that's going to be a thing that you're going to want to use as much and as close to that is you want to use that sky as much as you can. So a lot of folks might actually try to really push it and really try to do the meridian flip well past the meridian so that as much of that imaging time through the meridian is available to them. Yep. And, and I think that uh, what, what Nina is, is giving us and I'm having some, uh, some fashion failure moments with my green screen back here. Pardon me. <laughs> um, the, what, what Nina is trying to do is take that thought out of your mind. So you don't have to try to figure all that out. Just you, you tell it where absolutely it has to stop at where absolutely it's allowed to start at and let it figure out the best place to do the flip based on the size of exposures and what other, other tasks it's finding it needs to do in between. Right. So as we think about how to coordinate uh, the Gemini settings, uh, with the Nina settings, really your Gemini settings should be uh, that range that we talk about, right? Mm -hmm. That Gemini setting should, that doesn't really change in terms of, of what kind of strategy that you then want to employ in Nina, whether you want to try to image through the Meridian, yeah. anything else, that's kind of a fixed value. And at that yeah. point, that's really something that then you use Nina to kind of be clever or to you know figure out how you want to get extra information through the uh, meridian or imaging time through the meridian or whatever else it happens to be. Yeah. And in the advanced sequencer, we didn't really look at this, but that little, that little, that little widget that says meridian flip that you drop in is when it comes around and evaluates that it's answering the question, this is a place that I could flip if I needed to. And that's where it's going to make that decision. Should I flip and what do I do to make it happen? Right. And, and then it, you don't actually have to make that happen on every exposure pass. So, for example, you could configure your advanced sequencer to do, for example, an RGB check for meridian, RGB check for meridian, so that it forces the, for some reason, the group of RGB to be together on the same side. Um, maybe there's a reason you want to do that. I just kind of picked that example off the top of my head. So you, you can, you can kind of dial that as you, as you, as you need it. The, that, that thing tells you when it will attempt to evaluate, should I, and can I do a Meridian flip right now? Right. Can we, so, so, um, I want to just talk for a moment. I don't know. Have you finished kind of your slide based presentation? I think I th the last, the last two things that I wanted to, to mention are, um, this is what my current settings look like. So we just have the final value and to use that to make, and this is an example of a G11 with a five inch refractor. So you get kind of a ballpark of the kind of numbers you're probably going to get. But the most important thing is, yeah, but these, you can't pick these up and put them on your box, nor can you cherry pick and pick and choose parts of this to put on your box. You have to make a consistent set, just like we talked about right. before. And then, then lastly, um, the, 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 in that spreadsheet, these are just to summarize that these are the two things that you're going to input into it. The Western safety limit you got from setting up your uh, mount geometry and the earliest time you want to flip, which is, you know, recommended to be a couple minutes, one or two minutes. Uh, past, I don't past actually past allow zero meridian. to go in there because of round off problems. And it forces you to not have overlap at the meridian, which I don't recommend anyway. Um, and these are the values it's going to give you back minutes after the meridian, max minutes after the meridian, and the Western go to limit that you should put back into the Gemini. Um, here's a link to that spreadsheet where it currently is, and I think you're going to put that in the. Uh, yeah, we'll put that into the description. In, in the sure. notes. Okay. So can we back up a couple slides there? Sure. Sorry, I just realized you stopped your. You stopped your presentation, but I, I did want to point out a couple of other things uh, that you had mentioned. Um, in Nina, and we had talked about this previously um, in terms of the, we talked about ASCOM and, and kind of the things that it does uh, weirdly and differently. Um, 
But one of the settings in there was um, use side of peer, right? Yeah. And um, and you have it enabled, and I think it's enabled by default. Um, so the Gemini yeah. Ascom uh, driver supports side of peer reporting side of peer, right? And that's uh, that's helpful and good. Okay. And the okay, I think we're back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think it's maybe the the slide prior to. Uh, Right there. It, okay. Almost any of these will work, yeah. yeah. So it says use telescope side appear. And I want to point out that that's when we talked about um, the imaging application <laughs> strategy of it could issue a go to, it could, uh, Scott's leaving. Bye, Scott. Bye, Scott. Bye. Have fun storming the castle. Um, but we were talking about uh, it, it might employ one, one or two strategies on how to do this Meridian flip. Use telescope side of pier essentially. I don't know where where in Marina. Uh, <laughs> Again. It's kind of hang up you have there. I'm from Marin, it. by the way. So. I know. Ah, and I you probably it. have a boat too. <laughs> I'm an idiot. This is embarrassing. So Nina, uh, I don't know which one it prefers, but enabling this for a Gemini is a good idea because we support it. Uh, so use telescope side of pier should be enabled, and that will give uh, Nina either uh, an explicit first attempt to do that or it will use it as the second attempt. I'm not sure which one it is, but it's a good idea to enable that. My understanding is it'll try that first, but um, there's a lot of, there's a, this is the main item of confusion about the go-tos versus the side of peer uh, functionality. And again, after all that's kind of boiled down, it still looks like you need to honor these overlapping limits uh, to make this, this work correctly. While we're here, we should just look at a couple of these other settings. Um, they're, they're really not Gemini related, but just to clarify what they are, um, that you've covered what that basically is, recenter after the flip. That's the assumption that your meridian flip as performed by your mount is not perfect. If you've got a really good pointing model and your meridian flip will actually get you back on target close enough for your purposes, you might turn that off. Uh, but otherwise, it will attempt to do plate solving and recentering of the target to put it back exactly on, on target. Um, if you're having problems with plate solving successes, that might be an option or you might you might turn that right, off. But, but if you, I just want to pause there for a moment, uh, recenter after flip. So if you are plate solving mm -hmm. and it's working, you want to enable this. Because yes. I even have, uh, you know, I have a, a, a fairly sophisticated mount down in, in Chile. It's it's in, got encoders. It's got a all sky model. I mean, this thing yeah. is, you know, the the best that's available. And when it does a flip, I still want it to do the centering routines because, you know, when we stack all those images for night after night after night, you know, I don't want to throw away 50 pixels or 100 right. pixels or 200 pixels yeah. or whatever it is right. uh, because it wasn't quite centered uh, and I absolutely want to enable that. So my suspicion is everybody who's listening to this presentation probably has plate solving working and probably wants to leave that enabled. Yeah. Now, the, uh, <laughs> obviously, there's a little extra caveat, which is that your plate solving in of itself has uh, a tolerance associated with it. So you will be giving up some pixels on the side just be based on the tolerance of your plate solve. And you can't set that too low or you'll never succeed on plate solving. So again, I another- I mine at zero, just so you know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's another 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 whole topic of conversation. Um, settling time after the flip, it's just assuming there's some vibration in your mount and that you might want to wait before it starts uh, plate solving, guiding, all those things for the for the big slew to 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 die down. And then auto focus after flip. By the way, that is, that's a good idea to have that value greater than zero. I mean, I think for yeah. the Gemini, mine is maybe well, I have a 120 refractor. I set mine to maybe uh, 15, 20 seconds. Yeah. Uh, and for uh, larger telescopes, I have like, for example, I have a truss um, plane wave. It's got a lot more potential movement. It's, a, it's, it's I think the scope's probably 160 pounds or something. So we've got a lot of inertia. Yeah. You know, that yeah. might be 30 seconds, 60 seconds. So don't feel like it's a, a number that you put in there and just kind of like, well, everything sucks. You know, 
it's actually a very valuable number because if anyone's ever done plate solving and has seen their plate solve image come up and there's might be a little bit of movement in the stars and then mm. your plate solve fails, that's where you want to put in that um, settle time because that's going to help with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the uh, last one there is, is auto focus after flip. I have that off. Um, there, there might, I'm, I'm not actually sure the main, the main reason for this is not, is, is moot on a refractor. You may have, uh, you may have mirror flop, for example, oh, that's a good um, point. on an SCT. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the main example that I can think of that you'd want to refocus after a meridian flip because you're, 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 that's the most likely situation where you trigger a mirror flop problem on an SCT. Mm. So those are the other those are the other uh, degrees of freedom that you have in there. And again, this is just the settings on the Meridian flip, the plate solving as its settings, etc. Other tutorials are around those. Um, but this is the again to, to the the main summary view is still this one. You need to have that overlap. You need to figure out how to ensure that overlap before you proceed trying to figure out what other issues you're having with uh, failed failed um, meridian flips. If you do still have meridian flip failures, my recommendation is actually don't waste imaging time figuring this out. Don't do it at night. Do it in the daytime. Just set up dummy targets at noon and watch them cross the meridian and make sure that this is working for different increments, different, you know, just play with it when you're not needing to, uh, to get good imaging time. Fantastic. And again, on this screen here that we were just showing the last bit, uh, you don't need to go back to it, but um, yep. don't copy those settings and put them into your right. Selena, right? Those are just Edward's examples of what he's doing. You don't want to copy people's stuff. The spreadsheet is a great example of how you go about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, Edward, I just, I, it's, it's been a tour de force of understanding that I think you've produced. And we're just, we're really um, amazed by what you've done. And it's been, I think, really probably the clearest explanation that I've heard. Yes, it was. Uh, of how all this stuff works and how it relates to uh, the Meridian flip and how it relates to the Gemini settings. And I'll also mention, by the way, that all this understanding, although the specifics of the software may be a little bit different, work in Sequence Generator Pro and, and other yeah, software yeah. applications as well, right? So the same idea still exists. It may not be as flexible right, right. as uh, what Nina has, but that same concept still exists. So it's something just that, don't just don't use the spreadsheet for SGP. Yeah, yeah. So, right, I mean, that's right. You have different numbers. Yeah. But my, like, my point yeah. is, if you understand the concepts, those concepts yeah, still exactly. exist regardless of, you know, whatever the uh, whatever the applications you happen to be using. So. Right, right. Good. Well, I hope that uh, that will be useful. I, I certainly certainly a lot of aha moments for myself trying to figure this out. So, well, we appreciate it. And, I do. Yeah, um, that was great. When we see you, uh, so this is, we're going to put out this podcast. Um, if people have sort of follow-up questions, I'm guessing that we might see you on the Gemini 2 users forum if uh, people want to talk about this a little bit. Yeah, or the or the Los Mandy forum, either way. I tend to look at the Los Mandy forum more often than the Gemini one. Oh, okay. But so, e got either, it. One, either one will work. Yeah, so I should point out that we have actually three forums. We have a Lost Mandy forum, which is, is kind of generally for, for general mount questions, things okay. like that. Okay, okay. And then we have the Gemini forum, which is actually for the original Gemini 1, uh, which we don't make anymore, mm. and it's been discontinued, I think, for like a decade. 15, ten, yeah. yeah no, just a 11 years. 11, 11 years. years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the Gemini 2 forum, which is kind of questions specifically related to the Gemini 2 astronomical computer. So, okay. you know, maybe technically this is kind of really is a Gemini 2 kind of discussion, but, re but you know, again, a lot of these things sort of bleed over into the Lost Mandy forum and right, whatever yeah. else, so. Yeah, I didn't even know that. I, 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 I'm on a Gemini forum, and you know, I haven't paid attention to which one I'm on, but I'm pretty sure it's the Gemini two forum. <laughs> well, well, just to, just so you know, that's kind of kind of how it works. But again, okay, I mean, most good. people can kind of figure it out and, and know what's going on. But more historically, that's the, those are the groups of people that are going to be in those uh, in right. those forums, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. So. Okay, so Edward. Thank you again. We, we, we in Los Mandy and the Los Mandy astronom astronomical community can't be more grateful for the work that you've done. And you really, we spent a ton of time going through this stuff. I hope people are going to 
see some value in all that. Oh, of course they will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, well, you know, thank we you look- for having me on. That was yes. uh, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad it was a, I'm, a good I'm, session. I'm sad I didn't get to watch the tea time uh, pumpkin spice uh, extravaganza <laughs> in person, but. Tanya, I'll look you, forward to seeing that. The YouTube I'll, I'll, I'll have one of my pumpkin spice uh, exercise bars, uh, and I'll chew that while I'm watching that. Perfect. Just to, yeah. Okay. To honor the event. <laughs> Thank you. The pumpkin, just, just light the pumpkin spice candle next time you're imaging, yes, right? Yeah. Yes. There we go. We're, we're getting to that season where everything in the grocery store is pumpkin spice flavored. So. They they actually have like a Geico um, billboard on the corner here next to our office, and it says something about pumpkin spice like, it's like it's pumpkin just, spice insurance or something yes, like that i mean it's just it's insane yeah that's awesome you know fall is here <laughs> all right so with that uh boy this has been a super duper duper long one but very uh, informative. we're gonna bring it to a close edward thank you again for your thank time you. uh we look forward to seeing you on the forums you know you got some great stuff there we really appreciate it folks we're gonna dial us out so we'll see you next time okay see you next time thanks everybody. See all. thanks bye Talk to you soon yay I can't believe you showed him me eating. I didn't know what else to do. I was dealing with that Disney show. (laughs) I was eating popcorn, drinking drinks, dealing with the Disney show. Yeah. We came by and wanted some spare parts, right? (laughs) Yes. Emergencies, emergencies on shows. You know how it is.